Hooped, hooped, hooped. And there we go. Good job, Dave, for saving the day. Richard Elmore, nice to see you. And who else do we have? Bolenium. It's always Bolenium time around here. Jay Fox Hunter, nice to have you here. And who else do we have? Let's see here. Scrolling on down. Todd Purden, Project Blue Book. Nice to have you here. Mark Fountain, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you. And we're going to run out of time here, but that's okay. Glenn John McEnroe, the pride of Wimbledon, is here, everyone. And Fidgetiora, good to see you. And Gordy, I'm nice to have you here. Swamp Dweller, my man, how are you? Apollo, thank you for another super chat. That's just wonderful. Really appreciate that. And Blue Chicken, surprised you're here. All right. Uh, Noble Patrick, nice to see you. And there's Alien Girl, welcome to the show. And uh, Anonymous Rex, nice to have you back. Enzo, good to see you. 5900 buck. And let's see if we can get it. A couple more here. Anonymous Rex. And who will be the final one? Ian Herden, you got the final call. Super Chat is open. Horns up. Let's rock. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show and our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old baby the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We have an excellent roundtable tonight as it's time to take a look at the month that was in the weird, strange, supernatural, and ufological. UFOs really dominated this past month, and it's been absolutely insane with the news that has gone on, especially out of Washington, D.C. Tonight, we are joined by Nicole Sackich. She is with... Uh, Grant Cameron is a researcher as well as an author. We have Chad Smith. Yes, the Chad Smith making his roundtable debut. Sonny from Paranormal Chop Shop and our good friend Jim Goodall. And I'll tell you, the best researcher in the world when it comes to aircraft and aviation. Michael Schratt will be joining us maybe a little bit later as well. Everyone, welcome to the panel tonight. Always a pleasure to have all of you here, and let's kick things off right off the bat. We got a huge, huge bunch of news this past month regarding UFOs. We heard a, a new politician stepping on up. We heard of, of the military kind of firing back. I'm telling you, Jim Goodall, in all of your years in covering UFOs and, and the government and, and everything in between, have you ever seen the start of the, in my opinion, the war of words between the military-industrial complex in the United States and the politicians, and it's all over UFOs? It's, I mean, if, if you'd have said something like a year ago or two years ago that, that there would be the primary subject of conversations in D.C., I just said, hey, can I smoke some of the stuff you're smoking? Because it's it's nuts. I didn't. <clears throat> I mean, I've been doing this for 50 years, and, and there's there's been more coming out and, and more ex- you know, excitement from the powers that be in, in the last two years than it has been in the last 50. So uh, I just hope it continues. I hope I hope it gets more intense. And I just, oh, my doggie is here. Anybody want to see my doggie? Her, her name is Scarlett. Oh, beautiful. She's, beautiful. Oh, yeah, she's, Our radio she's audience a, can't see her, but she's a oh, lovely German shepherd. Yeah, she's a rescue. She was a feral dog. Uh, we figured that 
she was on her own from the time she was a puppy until she was about a year and a half old. And Maricopa County, which is Phoenix, their animal control people picked her up 4th of July last year in 2020. And she didn't, you know, she didn't know anybody. She didn't know any commands. She wasn't, of course, she wasn't housebroken because she was feral. So we adopted her in November uh, uh, 7th. Uh, of 2020 good for she you. is the sweetest girl in the whole wide world she did she doesn't answer to a name she doesn't know how to fetch she won't come back when you call her and she's sort of broken but we absolutely love her to pieces and she is she is just she is just the sweetest little girl beautiful my, my, my wife rosemary uh mm-hmm. said when, when i was looking i've been looking for 15 years to get another german shepherd and she said, well, there's just a dog. I said, no, 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 they're not just a dog. They're German Shepherd dogs. <laughs> yes, they said, are. You can like dogs, but you can't, you can't love them. And that lasts you for about 15 seconds. She gets down on the floor and she talks to Scarlet and then she, she rubs your butt, your, you know, Scarlet's tummy. And she's, Scarlet absolutely loves Rosemary. So, and vice versa. And if we had to pick, she had to pick between the dog and me, uh, I probably would come in second. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, I, th- I think the amount of information that's coming out, it's fascinating. I want to see where it goes. Uh, I know when I talked to Bob Lazar, when Tucker Carlson made the announcement that, uh, you know, the federal government went, government was admitting that we're, you know, we're being visited by craft not made of this earth. And then the other, someone else from the government said the same thing. And I called up Bob Lazar. He was all, he was all excited. And then he said, well, now I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop because they're not, this is not going to continue. And sure, sure enough, uh, they, they backed off on it and they, and they sort of uh, started hemming and hawing whether or not that they really wanted that stuff to get out or not. So it, 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 it is, is it is amazing times, and I'm going to bring in uh, some other people from the panel here, Uncle Jimbo, as we continue on. Chad Smith, I mean, I know you're relatively new to everything that's going on, but, I mean, hell, you're Chad Smith. You were like royalty around here, you know? <laughs> For whatever reason. <laughs> we, we don't know. We don't know. But when you take a look at the UFO story that has been going on recently, you know, how do you feel about this whole idea that, in my opinion, and many others now in the UFO world, including Grant Cameron, I know Nicole is kind of on the same page as well, and Grant said it just a couple of nights ago, regarding this is, we've never seen the military and the politicians butting heads over anything. Usually when the military asks for money in the United States, the government says how much. But now when it comes to UFOs, we're actually seeing a little bit butting heads. The politicians are saying, we want to know what's going on in our airspace, not just military airspace. And the military is like, no, 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 you civilians. We got this. We got this. I mean, this is this is unprecedented. Yeah, I've never heard of, well, obviously I haven't really been into this for very long, but I've never heard of anything like that happening between two two uh, sections of the government like that going you'd think that they would just get along and they'd have all this figured out and when you're growing up and reading all this stuff you just assume oh they have our best interests in mind and they've got it all figured out it's it's the government but the more you dig into this and find out that this has been going on for so long and the cover-ups have been going on for so long and now it's between two uh, government entities it's like I'm not really sure. You don't don't really know what's going to happen, but um, yeah, I just uh, don't know what else to say about that part. But um, this is where you finish it <laughs> off and say, "I am Chad Smith. I am Chad Smith." <laughs> I'll just throw out, I'm, "I am Chad Smith." That seems to get me get me through. All right, Nicole Sackage, I want to bring you in here on this topic because you were just on a couple nights ago with Grant Cameron. And we we got into this subject a little bit. I mean, because it was the news of the day last right, Wednesday. Right. And, I mean, we were all kind of caught off guard. And, you know, seeing on UFO Twitter, like, the jaws were dropped on UFO Twitter. Like, everybody was, like, 
really because the Pentagon literally sent out a statement saying we're setting up a new task force called the AOI MSG, which sounds like some bad spice for food. Okay. <laughs> and, and literally they basically told the politicians Stop debating this. We don't need to bring this into law. We're the military. We're the ones who protect this country. We got this handled. And the politicians were like, really? And UFO Twitter was like, you got to be kidding me. The military's trying to cut the politicians off and all the hard work that went into that. What are your thoughts a few days later? Um, Honestly, I think... I'm proud of our community and those who spoke out so quickly, you know, um, I think Grant brought up a few times, like if, if Lou hadn't have made his Twitter comment so early in the morning that people would be excited about this news from the Pentagon thinking, Oh, this, this is a big move, but it was, I mean, I, I loved his statement that he made because it's the truth. You know, these are the same people who have been giving us the runaround, telling us this isn't anything, nothing to look at, nothing to take seriously. It's also the same group that have just ignored experiencers or made us look like lunatics on purpose. So tread cautiously. I think the good part is like we brought up before this is another entity, another government body that we can now make our lists on, check it twice, bug, hold accountable, ask questions of. But when you compare it to Gillibrand's amendment and just knowing that that's in our Congress before us, you know, the people that represent us, and it is so inclusive of not only our military, but other countries and civilians. So to me, I don't know if, if they were on the scales, <laughs> I think one's tipped in our favor already. So I think it's the last ditch effort for the Pentagon to control everything that they still want to control because they know from 2004, or 2017, the cat's out of the bag. All right. From Paranormal Shop Shop, we bring in big bad Sonny Conway here. And Sonny, you know, I know you're kind of, you know, just jumping into the foray of, of everything we call ufology. But an outsider looking in, how are you feeling about this support that is going on regarding UFOs? I feel like... Um they have to come up with some kind of answers now. Cause like, like Dave says, guys, I'm new, but they have to come up with some kind of answers now for me seeing like your show, Dave, with your guests, even your chat room, even your fans, they've seen so many things and so many people are talking about it now. Um, like me, I, I seen some stuff guys and I wouldn't say anything about it. I was too embarrassed. And then once I found, actually I found UFO garage they got me out of that to where I wasn't so embarrassed. They brought me on their show. I told my story. And I thought, you know, everyone should know. You know, everyone should know. So now now that more people are coming out like me and telling their stories, and you have Dave, you know, radio hosts like this, that are letting us tell our stories, they have to have some kind of answers now. It's not just a few people anymore. So even, like you said, the military, the politics, the everybody has to have some kind of answer. Like if they're spending the money, on investigating ufos then like you said they have to tell us where that money's going it's our money they're spending well they've been hiding it for years that's the big problem uh, sunny as as you all know i mean they have an unlimited checkbook it's a checkbook that we would always want and i believe the united states spends more on the military in one year than the next 28 or 29 countries combined i mean it, it's it's something that is very profound for the American taxpayer. But when it comes to UFOs, Sonny, and I'll stick with you on this one, you know, when you take a look at, at the money that's being spent, I mean, to me, it looks like the military is saying, whether it's the Navy, the Air Force, the Joint Chiefs of, Chiefs of Staff, that we don't want the technology getting into the hands of anybody else. 
we need this technology. We want to play with their toys first. And and that's what the military industrial complex is all about. And that's what makes it dangerous, my man. Yeah, it's definitely who can well for me, I think that's all all the cool stuff we have, I think has been reverse engineered. I think at some point we came across something really high tech. There's no way we could have jumped with our technological jump in the last 20 years, you know, from just 20 years before that, look how slow it was. Now it gets faster and faster and faster. We get better and better stuff. And they had, we couldn't have just came up with all that stuff by ourselves, like cell phones and I can make phone calls from my watch. It's like Star Trek, guys. <laughs> like Dick Tracy. Uh, yeah, that kind of stuff is what I'm talking about. All right, Jim, let's bring you in. James Goodall here, legend in the UFO world and in the in the aeronautics world. This is a man who is the first civilian to ever photograph the F-117 stealth fighter back in 1989, and I remember that photo coming in. But, Jim, I mean, like you said, you've heard the rest of the panel kind of speak up here about the military-industrial complex. Are we starting to see something kind of break down here regarding the the camaraderie between the politicians who are writing the open checkbooks and the open checks to the military and the military who's you know maybe f- trying to flex their own power on a democratically elected society well the 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 military whether it's the air, it's usually the air force more than anything else but they're 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 very protective of their toys and they see they see the ufo uh uap flying saucers whatever you want to call it they they see that that is those are the, their toys and and that's the technology that they want to be to incorporate into future weapon systems and whatever so to have you know and it's it, to have politicians trying to play with it or influence it is just muddying up the water and they 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 want them they want them out of here. I don't. I don't want any politicians sticking their na- nose in our business. If we want, if we want to develop a ray that will blow up the world, then we're going to do it, and we don't need any politicians telling us we can't do it. So, it's it, it's all it's always been a a game of. Uh, and this is you know this is my ball. I'm going to play. We're, we're going to play with. You can't. We're not going to play the game if you if you're not going to use my rules. I'll take the ball away and go home. And that's and that's what they're they're telling the politicians. They stay. Keep your nose out of this. It's something that you don't understand. It's something that is you know beyond what you have the capability of really formulating uh, any type of strategy over. That's what we do. You you guys you guys spend the money you you know you 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 push the social you know the social justice stuff and we'll deal with technology you just you keep your hands out of there you give us the money we ask for uh, we'll get the job done but don't come in and and try to tell us or show tell us what to do or what we can or cannot do. Well, so and, I think- and that's the big thing, Jim. And I want to continue on with you on this because. I mean, the American military has always been very loud and very proud and boisterous about having the fanciest and latest toys to play with. Very expensive right. toys. You know, and before we bring in John Hudson here, uh, my friend, you for you and the people that you know regarding this subject, I really hmm. noticed that with that press release the other day that that they were once again pushing this threat narrative that you need us to take this on because this is a threat. It could be Russia. It could be China. After months of Russia and China being eliminated from the conversation. And now all of a sudden this press release comes out from the Pentagon stating Russia and China again and other adversaries, foreign or otherwise, that we have to protect the Americans from. As, as, I don't. I don't believe that any alien uh, society, alien uh, uh, invaders, whoever, however you want to, you know, you want to classify them, if they wanted to 
to destroy the earth, that they wanted to take over this planet, if they can go across the universe in a blink of an eye, if they can go 400 miles an hour underwater, if they can go 3,000 miles an hour in a straight line, they make a, a sharp 90 degree turn without you know, having uh, the occupants squished up against you know, the outer wall. They have the ability to do whatever they want w- against our weapons. So I don't, I don't, I have never, I have never seen the UFO community, aliens, uh, to be a threat. You know, it's it's not uh, wars of the world. It, it could come to that some you know, someday, but I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe that aliens were going to be using their advanced technology to destroy or to control us. All I right. think it's just a fallacy. I think they're observing us and they're, and they're really getting disgusted at what they're seeing. But I, I don't think, I mean, there's, there's been videos of, uh, you know, I guess they were testing a, a Minuteman uh, missile, intercontinental ballistic missile out of Vandenberg and it had a dummy warhead, but it was, it had, it had all the same electronics that, that a nuclear warhead would and a UFO was flying around it, zapping it. And all of a sudden, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, ICBM decided to go off course and they blew it up. So I think, I think they have stopped. They have stopped uh, us destroying the planet with nuclear weapons. I think that's, that's their biggest fear. And there's been all sorts of reports of, of unknown aerial phenomena over uh, uh, missile silos in the Dakotas and in Wyoming and Montana where, and they're not in, they're not interconnected, but on one particular event, these, whatever these craft were shut down a, an inter, entire missile wing complex. I don't know if it was Grand Forks or out of Ellsworth or wherever it was, or Francis E. Warren, but they, but it affected all their sites. And, and the sites are usually three silos in uh, three or four locations and that that would be a squadron or a, a wing of a missile wing, and and everybody associated with with that network of uh, silos, they lost communication and they were they were unable if they had to launch a missile, they were unable to launch one because whatever it was that was uh, sitting over the uh, sites decided that uh, they were going to shut them down. And there was there was nothing they could do about it. And and again, they, they weren't interconnected, so like they they weren't uh, like dominoes where one went down, then the other ones go just follow suit. They, this was a coordinated effort to shut them shut them down. Period. Very true, John Hudson. We got one minute to go before we got to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Do you think that this was the start of the? of the big argument between the military industrial complex and the United States government regarding UFOs. I think it's part of the continued debate. And and this is just, this is them throwing more fodder into the mix. This is them uh, drawing some guidelines that they can dance around. Um, I, I think it was a little bit of a lazy approach to uh, politics on their behalf. But um, I don't think it was at all surprising, and I don't think it's necessarily a, a terribly discouraging thing either. I think it's it's very much you know it's very much kind of expected behavior these days. You yeah. know, it's considered you know covering your own butt. It really seems to be that way. As we continue on here with the roundtable tonight, we got a good panel tonight. We do. We got Nicole Sackage, researcher and author. James Goodall, fifty plus years of research. And he's a great author, too. 75 books, I believe, he's got out now. Maybe 100. Maybe one for every year he's been on the planet. I'm not sure. Chad Smith. No, I'm not the prolific. Yeah. <laughs> Chad Smith, the Chad Smith. And, of course, Sonny Conway from Paranormal Chop Shop. John, the UFO man, wearing his beautiful fedora. We'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio when we return right after this. So stay tuned, everybody. Oh, wrong finger. (laughs) 
right, we're clear. We're clear. <laughs> hey, space travelers, Dave, this is John Larson, awesome. founder of the Chai to Chai awesome. Chai. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a network. I didn't hear it for the intro. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those <laughs> items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshop, my touring, even check out some of the hot songs. Yeah. I'm going to have to just quickly reboot this. Hold on. I'm trying. We have no uh, music sound on um, on uh, Streamyard, so I'm trying. To, I think I may have got it figured out here. Yeah, I, I didn't want to say anything, but when you were doing your intro, it wasn't playing any music. It it, uh, it, it was going through to to uh, Spre- uh, Spreaker. Spreaker, okay. Yeah. So I had it pulled up on YouTube on my phone and didn't hear anything. Yeah. That's okay. What on on yeah. So I'm hoping that, that this comes out. Uh, could, uh, give me two seconds here. Let me get caught up in the chat room. I'm still way behind in that. Felipe Ferrero, how are you, buddy? Thanks for coming on in. Uh, who else do we have that's come on in early here? And um, oh, Jenny, thank you so much for that super chat. Really do appreciate that, Jenny. <clears throat> Gorgeous Jenny. She added us on TikTok today. Love it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Marvin Dale Lincoln Jr., welcome to SOR Chat. And uh, Harley492, the Chad Smith, he says. Look at that. The Chad Smith. What's up, Harley? Good to see you. <laughs> Jazz, you got your homework done, bud? Oh, I doubt it. He's cheating. He's he's gonna he's wait cheating. till Sunday. He's, he's got someone else doing it for him. I yeah. bet. Kronos, welcome to the channel. How are you? I think I'm almost caught up here. Almost. Yeah, we're gonna get the music <laughs> thing figured out. Hey, Zero Cool, thanks for coming <laughs> on in. Lee Poping, how are you? All right. So I'm just gonna play something here, and you guys can tell me whether you hear it or not. Oh, I don't want that one. Hold on. Uh, let's just go right. No, no, no. We're uh, we're still not live, right? Uh, no, we're not live yet. All right, but live for YouTube. Hey, YouTube. But... I I had a guy message me earlier, Chad. I sent you the messages. That's a guy mm-hmm. that I met here in Pismo. He said something about Stephen Greer and uh, CE five. Yeah, it's it's yeah. in your text messages. Uh-huh. And he we wanted to know it. if I wanted to be part of it, and what? I told him if I did, you were going to be part of it too. So, <laughs> oh boy, you got to figure out how to get on an airplane. If All you right. can, you know, if you no, can do it no, no. on the cheap, try it. But just you know, be careful what you buy into. You know, no, I'm not buying into anything. It was just uh, offered. Hey, so, Chad, can you hear that on the YouTube sign? Sorry, guys. I was trying to get this figured out here. No, I don't hear anything just, on YouTube. Just wait, because there's a delay. I just heard you say... All right, so that's not figured out. Through. All right. So let's go options. Oh, the chat's definitely letting us know, too. Yeah. Audio codec, all speakers, no split. Hey, Phil, thank you so much for that super chat. Really appreciate it. Guys on YouTube, you may have to bear without music tonight. We're still trying to figure out uh, everything. Uh, We're lucky we have, uh, to be honest with you, we're lucky we have a show tonight, considering we were were here until about about, uh, 2.30 in the morning. 
trying to get everything hooked up. So bear with us. There's going to be some technical stuff that we're going through, but we'll get everything sorted out uh, going on forward here. Uh, so uh, the main thing is uh, we'll get it sorted out. Apollo times two, Chris, Thomas, Chad, Swampy, Willie times two, Swampy again, Jenny and Phil, thank you for the super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So we're going to go uh, right here in a second with uh, the second half hour of the round table. Here we go, everybody. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Well, I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with the roundtable. We are joined by John Hudson, the fedora-wearing UFO storyteller, Sonny Conway from Paranormal Chop Shop, Nicole Sackage, Grant Cameron's assistant researcher and author, James Goodall, and the legendary Michael Schratt. Yes, I love Michael Schratt. I'm telling you right now, every time I see Michael Schratt, I, sh- I I literally fangirl. I totally fangirl over him. I do, and I'm not afraid to tell him either. And uh, Chad Smith, how you doing? I, you know, I got to say this. Anytime we can get Michael Schratt on this show, I feel like a small kid waiting for their hero's autograph. I do. I, totally do. I, I guess- I gotta say, this person you've seen the two of them just hanging out together in, in like one of their living rooms, it, it kind of gives me the chills. It's kind of like, wow, like that's like, you know. It happened in San Francisco a couple years ago at UFO Con, where James Goodall, Michael Schratt, uh, Ben and Joe from UFO Garage, and myself, we partied hard together, hard, very and the hard. The whole time, Ben and George are like pinching themselves, going like. We're going to wake up. I know we're going to wake up. There's no way this is real. I know. It it was totally like that. Totally like that. Okay, topic number two of the night here on the roundtable. We're going to have some fun with this one. Okay, because I want everybody, if you haven't heard this story, I want everybody to get a good laugh in. All right? So we all know the Jim Baker show. All right? The, The televangelist who literally will beg for money, and if you don't give him money, including a good portion of your savings, you're going to hell when you die. Okay, that's pretty much how it is. Well, there's a story coming out of his show. I'll read this to you. Hold on one second here. (coughs) Excuse me. So he brings on this lady named Sharon Gilbert. Okay, she's all about the end times prophecy you know, making sure that we scare people as much as possible so we can get their money. So this is what she says. All right. End Times preacher Sharon Gilbert says that the alien that visited her in her bedroom imitated her husband, then tried to have sex with her, and then it claimed it was this being called Xerxes, and then Jesus got involved, And then the alien turned out to be a reptilian with a posse of gargoyles. Yep, Gilbert claimed that one night after she and her husband got married, that this other Derek, who looked like her husband, appeared in their bed. The real Derek was lying down next to me, she says. Other Derek sits right up out of him. She says, it startled her. That was not her Derek. No, no, no. So she asked this critter what its deal was because clearly the alien wanted to have sexual relations. You know, she says you'll have to watch a clip to find out what happened. You can find it on the Jim Baker show. But yeah, it looked like it was halfing creatures between aliens and gargoyles. 
Chad Smith, you're a good guy to start on this one. Let's go to you here. Let's see what I f- see if I have anything to add. You can't Laugh. make this up. You cannot make this up. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a pretty bizarre story. I'm Chad Smith. <laughs> Couldn't have you know that was probably the best uh, uh, sentence ever said on this show right now. Ever said. All right. All right. Uh, John, you look like you want to say something here. You know, it's just, it's, it, but so hard is that, you know, these stories, they don't help any of us. They, they really, they really don't. But when I'm going to miss them when they're gone because they're, <laughs> they're such beautifully funny, fun stories to, to tell people and to read when you're, you know, stuck in line at the, at the, at the, um, at the supermarket, you know, and, and there's, you know, that was tablet things, but like that, you know, what the problem is, is that what, what portion of what, of what she said is true. Some portion is, some portion is real. Some portion is based on something real. Some portion is based on some experience that she had or an experience that someone very close to them had, right? You know, how much of it is and how much of it is her spinning of it. And, and, oh boy, I don't even want to touch that. I, I have no idea. I have no idea, but, but wow, what a, what a, um, you know, I just, yeah. You know, I'd love I'd love to get a third part. I'd love to get a third part. I'd love to hear what her husband thinks, you know, um, you know, because he was evidently there for some of it, you know. Well, so. he was asleep. He was asleep. Uh, let's get Jim Goodall in on this, because if there's anybody who's going to have a say about reptilians, aliens, gargoyles and old Jesus himself, it's Jim Goodall. Hold on, we got you on mute here. Hold on, Jim. There you go. Yeah, yeah I want I want Michael Schratt to take no. that. No. Yes. yes. I, I was going to say a minute ago, I thought you scared Michael Schratt off with your question, Dave. I was like, oh, they started Pardon? talking about alien hybrids in bed, and Michael Schratt goes running off the screen. Yeah. No, he had he had he, uh, he had he had to fill his ho- hollow leg for a guy that is as as skinny as this guy is. He ate three times what I ate last night for Thanksgiving. Okay. I mean, I had one plate and that was all I could finish. And I think he went back at least once, maybe twice after that with a full plate. Wow. So, Must be but, nice. but I, I think, I think Michael should answer that question about uh, are the aliens visiting that lady at night and having sex with her. I mean, I've been accused of that many times, but uh, <laughs> being an alien or <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that one's out of my league. Yeah. Oh, really yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it, and again, it, like, like Chad's, I think it was Chad has just said it, that, you know, off the wall statements from people in this community don't do anything positive for the, you know, you know for the better, you know, for the greater good. I mean, you start talking, well, I had an alien reptilian come in and, you know, into my room middle of the night pretending to be my husband. And then he wanted to have sex with me. Well, the question and the question is, did she have sex with him? If so, was it really good? Was it alien good? Or was it just <laughs> typical? <laughs> oh, you're waking me up. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I don't know. This is, I just. This is the problem. This is exactly the problem. Is it? Is it? And a lot of those are actually scientifically legitimate questions to be asking. Not questions I want to be asking, let me tell you. But, you know, it's legitimate questions to be asking, right? I mean, it's like, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, you contrast this, you know, you want to bring Jesus into it. You contrast this with some of our, of our ancient um, mythology. And, you know, it was very normal for, you know, Greek gods to, you know, show up a, a appearing as the, the looking like the queen or the king of a, of a country and, and having sex with that person and basically screwing up bloodlines within within those legends right so it's like it's not like there isn't like you know a, any kind of um precedent for this sort of behavior no, I did either, it for, right i did it for decades so <laughs> all right sonny conway but, but, let's get you in here yeah. <laughs> man that one's a little crazy well of that, that one that one that one could just maybe be like roofied communion wine <laughs> <laughs> and a little too much of it yeah, and we're talking about Baker's house. He's done a lot of bad things. Maybe he is swinging with lizards. You never know. 
<laughs> Swinging with lizards here on Spaced Out Radio. Nicole Sackage. I know you had the name of my podcast, by the way. That's my new podcast name, Swinging with Lizards. That's right. <laughs> it at least needs to be a t shirt. <laughs> you can't make this up. Jim Baker <laughs> is doing it again. You know, don't forget, don't forget, the world is coming to an end, so buy his bucket full of food for three hundred bucks. It'll last you ten days. And the bucket will last ten years. All right, Nicole, let's get to you. Oh, well, you know, I'm going to take a hard swing in the other direction with this. <laughs> no. Oh, I mean, I, I, no, 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 no. I don't know if we want to call it the Grant Cameron effect or since I've been on Spaced Out Radio over the last few years, I just, I'm really comfortable with my woo hat on. But, you know, we often talk about how there's so many similarities between the paranormal and the spiritual world and ufology. And honestly, I laughed at this when I first saw it because it's Jim Baker's show. And I immediately flash back to like Tammy Faye wearing like big hair and makeup and of course all the controversy. But after I got my giggles out of the way, I have actually talked to quite a few experiencers who have encountered reptilians. And they are very scary at first. And another thing that I've kind of taken note about them over the years is that a lot of them are described as being very kind of sexual beings. Like they are interested in that. (laughs) So whether or not she went through with it, you know, to say it's good or bad, who knows? But that is an interesting fact. But another thing that I did like about this is how she said, Fake Derek sat up out of Derek. (laughs) And that reminded me of like an out of body experience. You know, was she seeing another consciousness or Derek's consciousness? I mean, if this is reflective of who you are, I mean, is Derek reflective? You you, you picked up on something really good. Like that was a good thing to pick up because I'm with you. I think that's what she saw. But what I loved was that she Can was I finish so comfortable. First, John? <laughs> oh, please. No, no. Okay, please, please. Go ahead. Please, please. Go ahead. Okay. But the other thing that I was going to say is setting up out of bed and she also called him out and she was like, who are you? You're a liar. And then that's when he went to Xerxes. I'm another person. And then she even invoked, she invoked Jesus, which a lot of experiencers do try to call out this their beings and they do change form on them. And the other thing I thought was interesting is when she invoked her higher power, which was Jesus, it left, it left. So you hear that often with experiencers, they tell orbs to leave and they leave or they call them in and they come. So it's not as out there in this woo world as we think it is. Nope. And I think it's great that it's coming from a super Christian source. So I think it lends credibility to some cases. Now you can go, John. <laughs> no, I, honestly, I don't even, I, I just, it something you said just triggered something. I don't remember what I was going to say, but, but I just, you know, I, 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 it's it's so hard because you know it there's there's such a giggle factor to all this and and it would have existed even without all the all those years of tabloids it would have existed without all those years of x-files it would have existed without all those years of other you know um you know media you know lambasting of the topic i mean because it's it, a lot of it's very difficult topics right but to me like to me this is like one of, this is like the big elephant in the room in that essentially you know everyone's talking about them um, about wanting disclosure and wanting, you know, more public dis- discussion of, and 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 you know debate about this topic, and the the thing that no one seems to want to really discuss is the fact that th- there is an aspect to all of this that the public doesn't wa- doesn't want to talk about, and and is is unlikely to ever really want to talk about. Because like no one really wants to talk about it. Like the only people that want to talk about it are the people that have believed they've experienced it, and they just want to talk about it because they feel they have to, right? But, because they they experienced it, and they have to get it off their chest, right? Like like, but uh, no one else wants to talk about it, right? And for a lot of people, 
that's the biggest part of their entire experience or you know vacation package right <laughs> is that aspect of it right and so it's like and so for us to just be kind of living in this like you know this kind of you know illusion of 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 you know a propulsion and, and consciousness and, and you know kind of floating around in this, in this lovely land for a while and then and then we have things like this come up and we all laugh and giggle and it's like and you but you can kind of see some of the reality in it and you realize that there is a reality to it what that reality is in, in that one woman's case i have i have no idea and 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 nor do i no i'm not gonna say that i don't know and um uh but um but you know there is the bigger problem of this is actually the big smoking gun. This is like the big, big elephant in the room. This is like, like the whole hybrid program thing. The whole that whole that whole sexual aspect of this entire phenomenon is a really weird aspect of it. That is a big part of it for a lot of people, and for some people, it's no part of it. But for a lot of people, it's the majority of it, and it's not something that you know. I think. I don't know. I just I, I think we're still pretty far away from Tucker Carlson talking about it. Yeah, <clears throat> Nicole, I think you brought up some very good points. I mean, yeah. there is the sighting of an entity. There is sighting of extraterrestrials, something supernatural, you know, uh, maybe a near-death experience or out-of-body experience that her husband was having yeah. or maybe a demonic entity within him that has uh, latched on to his soul like an incubus should. Okay. I watched I watched the video from the article and it was interesting because she did say when it came back that's when and there were these other smaller beings there and I don't know what they looked like gargoyles sort of I don't know and I'm like oh were they little grays like that's that's the first thing I thought Oh they so, had aliens she's and got then aliens cut off. So I I I've eaten too many crow sandwiches over the last two years to completely just laugh at this. So, you know. Yep. All right. Yep. Well, Chad Smith, final word. Final word. It's usually the just way it. It. <laughs> <laughs> Um, You know, to be honest with you, I'm not a whole lot read up on that. Uh, news article that you're or that news thing that you were just talking about but it does sound very crazy you were supposed to fill in with <laughs> i'm chad spin you, you blew it right there you blew it all right we're going to continue next on time. the round next table time. here on spaced out radio we have a great panel tonight and going back <laughs> in time here we're going to spend some time on this in the next half hour as well let's go to nasa <laughs> nasa for years has been denying claims about anything extraterrestrial, anything coming from space. We're all a bunch of lunatics for believing in this UFO stuff. They're the pros. They're not supposed to see anything. Or if they're not seeing anything, nobody should be seeing anything. And yet, here we are, Michael Schratt, here we are with Bill Nelson, the new head of NASA, just a couple weeks ago, Mentioning the word extraterrestrials because he's seen the Navy videos. Is this precedent setting, my friend, in regards to having the head of NASA all of a sudden invoking the word extraterrestrials in his speech? Um, you know, I think the one way to, to change all this would be to actually get to the physical evidence to move this field forward. Um, getting to the vaults at MacDill Air Force Base, Tampa. Uh, let's see, Langley Air Force Base, Virginia, and then Homestead Air Force Base, Florida. If you could get to those facilities, they could provide a lot more of the physical evidence that we're needing. And I think it would trump even what NASA has. So that'd be one way to actually move this forward. Jim, how about yourself, Bill? Well, uh, Bill Nelson. Well, this this has sort of relates to Bill Nelson's comment. Is a couple of years I worked for the Museum of Flight in Seattle for ten years, and my boss called me up one afternoon or one morning and said, "Hey, we you know, we need an extra body for for a luncheon they're having over future flight, and I need you to go over there." I said, "Okay, fine." So I 
I went over there and I found my name, my name tag on the table. I sat down and a few minutes later, this other gentleman sits down next to me and I look at him and I about fall off my chair and I introduced myself. Hi, my name is Jim Goodall. I says, yeah, I'm Buzz Aldrin. I said, I knew that when you walked in the door, I said, what's your feeling about UFOs? And his, I mean, his eyes got really big and he sort of turned his head and didn't say a word. Good but, for you, man. I mean, I, I, I asked that I asked the, the vice president general manager of the skunk works in June uh, to his face in the back of a limousine. All right, Jeff, what is, what is Lockheed skunk works involvement in UFO alien technology? And nice. he, he responded to the fact that, and I, and I believe him that he has not been briefed on anything along those lines in his position. He said, it, it doesn't mean it didn't happen in the past, mm. but it may be so compartmentalized that I don't have any access to that information. And I don't have a need to know, even though I'm in charge of the most secretive uh, aerospace company on the planet, the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Yeah, but he's only purview is, is what's what's under his purview, like current programs, programs that or that still have budget items that fall in his jurisdiction. There's certain things that may drift in and out from outside areas that fall under his purview, depending on on, you know, like a, a new version being spun up or a, an investigation into some part failure. But for the most part, these things are fairly confined, you know, over a certain periods of time. And if you weren't in leadership during that period of time, you don't have any reason to ever go back and look at that stuff. Right. And, and, and stuff comes and goes. And just because it was here at one, at one time, an example, the, the original Blackbird was, was built, paid for and designed uh, for the central intelligence agency. That airplane was retired for 20 years before anything, you know, leaked out the fact that the CIA had their own Mach three airplane. And I helped, you know, I helped push some of that stuff out. Uh, but there are programs that have that have come and gone. That you know, guys who have worked on them, uh, you know, they're sworn to, you know, they're sworn, sworn to absolute secrecy. And just because the program came and went, and now the program is gone, it's dead, it's buried. You don't have a need to know what happened back then. So, so Jeff, I think Jeff gave me an honest assessment of of what he has been exposed to. Now, if it, had been, if it had been something he couldn't talk about, he would have said, hey, I can't comment, or no comment, or just, he could have just shrugged his shoulders and not said a word. But he didn't. He said that he had not been read, in, you know, read into any of those types of programs, but he did not deny the fact that they, that they did or did not exist. It was just something that he he wasn't, he didn't have a need to know, and that's and that's the most important thing about a, a security clearance. And I I had it I had a uh, above top secret clearance for twenty seven years, but I didn't have the need to know a lot to a lot of stuff, so I so I never had the opportunity to find out. All right, but but but, but Jim, does this not? Uh, as we only got about forty seconds left, does this not put a lot of pressure on the words of Bill Nelson? for finally having the head of NASA talking about the UFO subject? Well, yeah, but, you know, President Reagan you know, mentioned the fact, we're talking about SDI, he said that you know, would also be used to point outward to protect us from an invasion from alien beings from outer space. Yep. And that was part of this. That was hypothetical, that was, though. We don't know that. As far as we know at the time when he went on record... No, but but SDI has had no opposition from any of the typical organizations and countries that would would go after our weapons of of mass destruction. They the Russians were not uh, were were fully on board with it. The Chinese were. Uh, all of Europe was on board with it. So it it there was it, it was valid, and the fact that they had also. Uh, it wasn't an off-the-cuff remark by President Reagan. It was in his prepared speech. Okay, hold that thought, panel. James Goodall, Michael Schratt, Chad Smith, Nicole Sackage, Sonny Conway, and John Hudson, a packed house here on the SOR Roundtable. We will return 
on Spaced Out Radio with more talk about NASA. And then we'll introduce you to a gentleman named John Ramirez next. All right, we're clear. Get your horns up with okay. me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock record, out with Little Brother is watching. The official show, things. was it? What's that? <laughs> Swinging with lizards wasn't too R-rated for your no, show, was it? Not at all. Hey, he's, he's Canadian. Don't stream your to listen <laughs> as the source, either through the sound card or through cable out. Okay, stream yard. I'm, I'm glad I didn't get have your to music. comment on NASA. They just kicked me out of their chat room. I'm not happy with them now. Now I'm 100% in belief with Big Willie. The earth is flat. Yeah, you're banned now. You're banned from NASA chat. <laughs> All right. If I go like this, this shouldn't affect anything, I don't think. All right. Can you guys, uh, Chad, can you speak for a quick second? Testing one, two, Chad Smith. Testing one, two, Chad Smith. Okay. Can can we just make sure that everybody uh, hears uh, Chad right now? One, two, 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 one, 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 two, two. Testing one, two, yeah. Chad Smith. In the chat room, sorry. Uh, Clam, Clam, uh, I know you're in there. Can you can you tell me if you heard uh, Chad or not? Sounds like yes. Okay, good. All right, so we got that. Um, okay, so if I go settings here. We're just trying to get the uh, new audio going here. Make sure that everything is a okay. Um, I gotta get. Yeah, you have to get a new board. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I had another board. My big board that uh, I like to show off. It, it's it's now a paperweight. Uh, one second, my tech guy. We we got like one minute though, right? Uh, we have about four four minutes. Four minutes, awesome. All right, my tech guy is coming in. <coughs> yeah, I thought we had this figured out last night. Well, we got the speaker part figured out, which is cool. Yeah, we never tested YouTube. Forgot to do that. Well, we could hear it though, like in our. Oh, true. Yeah, we could hear it on speaker. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. I'll know any second when Chuck gets into my system. How you doing, Michael Schratt? Hanging in there. Doing good. I was actually just going to contact you and see if uh, uh, you wanted to come back on, and then all of a sudden every, uh, everybody's got Michael Schrattitis right now uh, getting you on there, and, you know, that's my disease, man. My disease. Oh <laughs> hey, they, they don't come any better than Michael. That's they do uh, not. No Jimmy, one, no one so does right. it. No one does the research he does. And he you know, he has it all at his fingertips. He has it, you know, illustrated. Um, he's a uh, would be lost without him. Mm, I don't know. You're not smoking a controlled substance, are you? No, my name's not James Goodall. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, you should, you should see in the four days when the cousin brothers were at my house. That was nuts. Oh, I that bet was I bet the hippie lettuce was going crazy. Oh God. Yep. Yeah, it sure was. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. You gonna have enough room there, Michael? I think so. <sighs> I love watching I'm Chad Smith. Hey, Fabster, thank you so much for the super oh, chat. <laughs> I love the watching watching my mouse go like oh, 
Iberata, how are you, man? JJ, how are you? Welcome to our chat room. Iberata, we have one listener in Singapore. It's our man, Iberata. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, that works. Yep. Cool. All right. <clears throat> we got one minute, guys. One minute. Okay. Looks like Chad's gone to the dogs. Yeah. Yeah, he always goes to the dogs. You can't trust him. I thought Jonathan Davies was coming. He he's supposed to. I I I think he slept in. I mean, it's like five in the morning there right now. Right. I know. I would have liked his perspective on a lot of this. Really would have. <clears throat> Thirty seconds. I want to say a big thank you to Apollo times two, Chris, uh, Thomas, Chad, Swamp Dweller times two, Willie times two, Jenny, Philly. Or uh, Philly, Phil, uh, John, we will get to your question and Fabster for the amazing super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. And uh, to all our new subscribers, thank you so much. We're just a few away from 14,000 horns up. Here comes Bumblefoot, everyone. Mike's off, guys. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. And on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever we are. Where uh, on this planet called Earth, we want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. And I can't use my mouse right now because my tech is in my computer. So your password is Tractor. Tractor is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam <laughs> sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram. Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Here we go. We got the Paranormal Roundtable going on tonight. Michael Schratt, James Goodall are here. Sonny Conway from Paranormal Chop Shop. Nicole Sackage, researcher and author from the Unbiased UFO Report for the Fedora Wearing John Hudson and Chad Smith. John, I want to start with you on this one as we continue on talking about NASA and Bill Nelson starting to use the word extraterrestrial instead of Russia and China as the obvious ones on the Tic Tac technology. The other thing that he mentioned was that there are a heck of a lot more videos that he has seen than the 144 that had been presented in the original DNI report earlier this summer. So I'm curious, John, we have Bill Nelson coming out and using the E word extraterrestrial and saying he's seen more videos than what we were supposed to know. Yeah. So I, I think it's one, I think it's fairly safe to say that, that he is, is currently enjoying the kind of the upper, um, upper um, levels of, of knowledge, um, at least in the, in the administration. Um I think that you know. I think he went into NASA knowing that NASA had a had a had to say a range of here of where they were on this topic, and that you know he had a knowledge of maybe a, a range from here to here, um, and maybe he may not be able to get NASA as far forward as he is, but he may not be able to get NASA you know half as far as he is, sort of a thing. So, and I, I really, I actually do, um, I actually think there's a really really good chance that one of the reasons why he was specifically selected was as someone who could help NASA take, you know, 10, 20 steps forward 
um, as far as truing up about this topic. But it's probably going to take more than one NAS administrator to do it. It's going to and it's going to take some time, right? Because the thing is that the motivations for each one of those those um, you know whether you want to call them lies or mistruths or or um, uh, 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 um, you know obscure you know whatever you want to call it, it, it there was there was very it, it happened over decades and so there's very good chance there was completely different motivations for most of them right and so you know it's going to take a while for people to you know kind of tease it all apart and figure out what what was said when and why and and for what motivation and under whose orders and and you know it's it's gonna it's it's just it's gonna take it's gonna take a while no and i agree with that john it is going to take a while and there has some trust that has to be made i'll tell you what i didn't like about it and this is what i would like to talk to with everybody on the panel here tonight he's mentioning the u.s navy he being bill nelson the head of nasa talking about the u.s navy pilots and how he's talked to navy pilots and i think that's wonderful the guy's done his homework a lot of the former astronauts have always been Navy pilots. There's always a big tie between the U.S. Navy and NASA. We always think it's the Air Force, but it really is, realistically, it's always been the Navy. And this is what troubles me about it, all right? He is talking about he's seen the videos from the United States Navy. I'm thinking, dude, you are the head of NASA, Nicole Sackage. You're the head of NASA, and you're worried about what the Navy is seeing? What about all of your fellow astronauts that have seen things in space? What about the Russian cosmonaut who earlier this year saw a five lights in the shape of a boomerang and photographed it and videoed it from the International Space Station? What about the idea that somebody like Donna Hare, a former NASA employee, who watched people scrub photos of alleged bases and spacecraft from NASA photos that were brought out to the public. I mean, this is what's bothering me here. Like, check in your own closet here, Bill Nelson. Nicole. You're muted. I will agree with the check for the skeletons in your own closet before you go on national television. <laughs> Um, but with that said, I, I do agree that some of this might be compartmentalized and NASA may not even know what they have. I mean, if they're focused on their missions and this is stuff in the background, they might not necessarily even know what data they've already collected. So I get you. I'm going to gonna cut you off there for a quick second. I understand where you're going with that. But you're the head of NASA, Bill Nelson. Okay, <laughs> You shouldn't be talking UAPs, UFOs, whatever you want to call them. Except don't call them aliens because Demi will come after you. All right? What you have to uh, You're the head of the biggest space program in the world. Give us some juice, man. Yeah, he could have came out with his own video set, I think. You know. And like you were saying, everybody seems to be interested in the Navy. Well, that's because the Navy's been in it all along from the very beginning. They've never not been in it. And they have crazy tech. So, yeah, I think everybody's interested in what they have, including NASA. But I, I don't know. I can cut him some slack, but it would have been great if he would have been like, look what we got. <laughs> Outside of I ISS, you know, we don't know what it is. <laughs> Look, it's a ray gun. <laughs> I don't know. We, we don't want that footage. <laughs> like, tell me where that damn Marvin the Martian is with his PU-36 space modulator. That's what I want to know, Sonny Conway. Okay, because to me, I think the stupidity of it all is Bill Nelson actually using the word extraterrestrial. Maybe I'm nitpicking here. Maybe I am. I just found it a little odd. Using the word extraterrestrial, these craft may not be from here, yet he's not checking his own program to see what they know, Sonny? I mean, is that not a little ignorant to go in a, into a press conference and talk about the Navy when you run the when you run NASA? I don't get it. And the media didn't even respond to it. 
They didn't even play ball here. If I'm sitting in that press conference, I'm putting my hand up, Sonny, and I'm saying, hey, hey, Bill, hey, Wilhelm, Wilbur, whatever your name is, okay? How about them aliens you're covering up for? Have you checked in your own NASA closet? Uh, am I wrong? No, and I think uh, also I learned recently NASA don't like questions. <laughs> I jokingly put on their NASA chat, in chat, in their live chat, you know, is the earth flat? And I was kicked oh. out. Oh, yeah. I was, oh, kicked yeah. Out. I was kicked right out. So no jokes with NASA. <laughs> but if you're going to go out there, like you said, you better have uh, all your stuff covered because – I've seen that. I know everyone's got to have seen that video where there's the little thing flying in and they're NASA shot and you see like a little laser come up and it turns and goes the other way. It's out of there. I, I, I got to find a good copy of that. That to me is one of that. That to me stands alone as one of the best, the, the single best videos I've ever seen okay. of, of so, any so, unexplained phenomenon. Somebody detail is, that video before we continue on here because you can't drop how awesome a video is without explaining it to those who haven't seen it. So do you know right. the details about it, Sonny? Well, from what I see is it's a it's a NASA shot of a it's it looks like it's coming from a satellite, maybe a camera on a satellite. And in the background, in the far background, you can see this little light moving in, I want to say towards Earth. Okay, so it's coming down and moving in. It's not moving in towards the satellite, it's just moving across the sky in the background. And as it's coming down, you see a beam of light shoot up a solid beam really fast it shoots up from towards earth and shoots towards this thing and before the beam of light can get to it it stops changes its direction and shoots out the opposite way from the beam of light it actually runs from the beam of light that was shot at it and it was shot directly at it you can see it in the video and 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 i don't care if you if you if you want to look at that video from the point of view of special effects student you want to look at the video point of view of a, of a of a raw physics student you want to look at that in the point of view of a of a gravitation like there's so many different points of view you can look at that video and they still all leave you going huh like mm-hmm. what like what did i just see like, what was that right like i mean the energy god the energy levels that it would take to fire a beam from the surface of the earth that high into the atmosphere that it would be that the energy level would still be it, it would still be formed in a way and at, at, an, at a higher that an object in space would be able to detect it and move out of its way and not just get like hit with a flashlight i can't even imagine i can't even imagine like just that video is blows my mind i really want to know i want someone to explain that video maybe michael I'd Schrader like, like or, or james goodall could explain it did you ever see that video guys regarding regarding uh the the laser beam coming from earth um <clears throat> all i would say is since we're talking about nasa and i don't want to change the subject too much here but i think it's important to remember the testimony of astronaut gordon cooper he was one of the original seven mercury astronauts he was very outspoken And uh, he went all the way to the U.N. You know, he he did write a letter there. This was back in 1978. Um, He had an attempted UFO intercept over a West German air base in 1951. He was involved in an incident at Edwards Air Force Base back in 1957 where, huh, it's got to be one of the best cases ever. Uh, This is back in 1957. This is at Edwards Air Force Base. And they were filming the setting up of precision landing equipment on the dry lake bed there at Edwards. And about a 30-foot diameter disc-shaped craft hovered over the dry lake bed. The landing gear retracted out. It sat on the dry lake bed for about a minute and a half. Then it hovered uh, about 20 feet above the lake bed. The gear retracted in. The craft took off. And they got it all on motion picture film reel. So... The concept what? or the thought that NASA doesn't have any evidence that film that they got this all from NASA's own cameraman. They got this all filmed on motion picture film reel. That film was brought back to Edwards Air Force Base. Gordon Cooper developed the film. It was put into a pouch. That pouch was 
handcuffed to an Air Force courier that came from Andrews Air Force Base. And at that point, it disappeared into oh, this right. hidden vault that no one knows. So we know they have that film. It's an official U.S. government. You could call it, uh, you know, this is going to be a repository of one of many. They have it's they certainly operate in the principles of no single point failure, because if there's a fire in one of these warehouses, they don't want to lose the other one. So where is that film? Jim was talking about the Arctic regions. There were uh, after World War Two, they took B, uh, B-29s. They filmed them. Uh, they filled them with high resolution cameras and going over the Arctic regions and over Antarctica, they filmed UFOs taking off from icebergs following the B-29. And these, these craft would lock themselves between the trailing edge of the main wing and the leading edge of the horizontal stabilizer within 20 feet of the fuselage of the B-29 with all the cameras clicking off. They have all that footage Everything that Gordon Cooper had talked about, he had another sighting in 51 where he tried to intercept multiple UFOs that flew over the West German air base back in 1951. It was the meteorologists that pointed it out to the pilots. Um, so where where is that information? Um, also, j- just to continue on here, some of you might be familiar with a TV program called Cooper's Treasure. Um, When Gordon Cooper was orbiting the Earth, he had a magnetometer on board the spacecraft and he was clicking off photographs and they were getting these hits in these photographs, these highlighted areas. And it turns out that a lot of these highlighted areas had a lot of iron material in them. So they were potential shipwrecks because Gordon Cooper was a huge adventurous guy and they cataloged like thousands of of these hits on there. So it was the first space-based treasure map ever devised in the world. And and that's why they call this TV program Cooper's Treasure. Uh, Gordon Cooper, the last three to five years of his life, he was good friends with a a, a gentleman named Daryl Miklos, and they were both treasure hunters. And about three years ago, I met with Daryl and we did a 90 minute interview and he laid out everything that Gordon Cooper told him before he passed away. And basically he told me, now this is coming from Gordon Cooper. This is not coming from me. This is coming secondhand from Gordon Cooper. Uh, Gordon Cooper told Daryl Miklos, he told me that in 1983, the United States government landed on Mars. I can't prove that. He can't prove that. But this is what Gordon Cooper had told Daryl Miklos. And he said that the way they got there is... They got there using the rebreather device from the movie The Abyss by James Cameron. That's how they got there. So these are just some of the things that Gordon Cooper had talked about. Michael, I want to ask you in regards to this, if you don't mind, before we bring in James here. Do do you believe then that somebody like Bill Nelson should be talking about these craft being otherworldly and extraterrestrials could be visiting here, especially when he is only pointing to the U.S. Navy. And and I don't know if you were surprised, as I was, that during that press conference, not a single reporter asked him about what NASA knows or what's in well, NASA's go, box that they're hiding. Go, go. Yeah, I think we should go back to the Brookings Institute with the Brookings Report, early 1960s. And it said that during our discovery and exploration of the outer planets, if we ever came across any extraterrestrial artifacts, it would be in the best interest of the public to deny publication and never reveal that information to the public for fear of religious institutions crumbling in a nutshell. That's what they were saying. So even in their own documents, they state they're not going to tell us. That's very true. James Goodall, let's bring you in yeah. on NASA's. Well, the, the, you know, you, we're t- earlier we we're talking about the United States Navy right after world war two, it was the army that controlled all the technology, whether it be alien technology or just foreign technology. And then it <clears throat> laid in the, uh, I guess the late 1950s into the mid 1960s, that was taken back. That was taken from the the army, and is now controlled by the navy. That's why when Bob Lazar was employed out in the desert, and and his W twos, 
we're from a, a division or an organization within, within the United States Navy. And another thing that you're talking about astronauts knowing, you know, knowing and seeing things. Someone asked Story Musgrave when they were re- repairing the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. He was out there for five hours. He said, well, what are you doing that five, doing that five hours? Because, you know, the work was just a little bit here, a little bit there, waiting for stuff to, you know, to do this, to do that. He said, I was looking for flying saucers. I was looking for or, or UFOs. I'm not sure exactly what the quote was. But you, 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 talk, you talk to these astronauts and you, you, know, and you mention flying saucers and UFOs. They don't look at you as a kook. They, but it, it, sometimes they'll take the wind out of their sails because they know they, you know, they really are not in a position if they're still with NASA to say anything. And now, I think, does every astronaut, Jim, have to sign a, a major top secret non disclosure agreement about UFOs? Because I once read a book years ago, like oh, we're going back you. about yeah. fifteen years ago that stated that almost every launch of a NASA rocket or shuttle has been followed by UFOs. I've, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of them have been followed by, by UFOs. The, Na, NASA, just by its charter, uh, should not be dealing with anything that's classified. It's a, it's a, it's a public open agency that's you know d- dealing with uh, space and, and aerospace technology, and they do, and in their, I think in their charter I may be wrong. I've been wrong more than once in my life, but uh, I don't I don't think they're 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 in a position to you know to you know to keep secrets. They're not supposed you're not supposed to have nothing nothing that NASA does is supposed to be classified. There's organizations with the United States military and the Department of Defense and other the spook agencies to deal with stuff like that. But as far as NASA, NASA is supposed to be a public open agency without any access or dealing with classified information or, or classified uh, yeah. technology. You OK there, Jim? You didn't fall yeah. and break a hip, did you? No. OK, just no. making sure. Hey, I almost did at the... Uh, I was at Disclosure Con up in, up in Pine Top here in, uh, a couple months ago, and I'm giving a talk on how to how to snoop how to snoop on our government in and around Area 51 without getting shot. And as and my laser pointer wasn't working very well, so I'm at the the back of the platform. It's about 30 inches off the ground. And I'm pointing, and all of a sudden I disappear. <laughs> I stepped off the back of it, oh. and, and when. You, when you're when you're 20 years old or 30 years old, people will laugh. When you're in your 70s, everybody goes, "Oh my God!" They all come running, and I just got up. I mean, I didn't, I didn't bruise myself. I didn't hurt myself. I didn't, I didn't pull anything. I got right back up on the on the stage and and con- continue where I left off. And after I'd finished, I almost I, I I was I said to myself, God, I should have said, now that I have your attention. <laughs> I mean, because literally they said. I was there and then I wasn't. And it just really, I mean, it really shocked the hell out of some people. But, and that, NASA's not supposed to have classified stuff. NASA's not supposed to, uh, to do with, with any type of program that is, that is classified, period. It's not in your charter. They're a public agency there to uh, push the boundaries on aerospace, both space and, uh, and, Aerospace, yeah, that. Third phase of Boone, uh, guys. Hi, cousins, brothers. How are you? Thanks uh, for listening oh. on in. Yeah. Hey, Blake, Brett, how's yeah. you going? It's good all. Yeah. They say the problem with NASA is that sometimes they don't explain the anomalies, a.k.a. UFOs, that they capture on film over and over again, which is, I think, a very accurate comment. And thank you to Third Face of Boone for jumping on in here and and uh, joining us with that great comment. We're going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour here on Spaced Out Radio. And when we return, we're going to learn about a guy named John Ramirez. Former CIA says aliens and hybrids are real, and that is the future of what we are going to be seeing. We'll learn more about this when we return on Spaced Out Radio. Nicole Sackage, John Hudson, Sonny Conway... 
Michael Shred, James Goodall, and the Chad Smith, everyone. Oh, Space Out Radio he returns Chad right after this. Yeah, the Chad Smith. Like, you just can't make this shit We're up, We're adding Jim. to the entertainment online for no, Space Out no, Radio. No. I'm Amber Becker, yeah, and I want to invite right. you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And ch- yeah, can't make that up, buddy. Cannot make <laughs> that up. Hey, the the, uh, the cousin brother spent four days here with me here uh, in September. September? Yeah, whatever. It was a couple months ago. That is that is the uh, I killed a lot of brain cells in those four days. Oh my god, we had a ball. Uh, Doc Skinner came down. Uh, John DeSosa only lives two blocks from me, and uh, I wanted to. You know, I didn't even know. I mean, I've known I've known John. I've never met. I never met him personally. And then cousin brother said, "Yeah, well, he lives he lives in Tucson area." I said, "Oh, really? Where? We're in Oro Valley." Well, that's where I live. And uh, and it turns out it, he's two and a half blocks from my house. I can walk to it in just a few minutes. And it's just uh, oh, we got another I am Ch- Chad Smith. Okay, uh, so I my brain just my brain just shut down for a second. That's, okay. That's usually what happens when people see Chad Smith. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chad's a superstar. Okay. Hey, all of a sudden. hey, we don't all make the ru- Jim. We don't make the rules around here. You know, we don't okay. have we don't have that Chad Smith type power. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't follow rules, so that's okay. He's never been a rule fowler. I'm lucky he lets me be his co-host. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm lucky to have a co-host. <laughs> Just don't ask me any hard hitting questions. I got to do this for Melissa, guys. <laughs> Melissa, this for you. That ha 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 ha. <laughs> 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 giving me that's... crap about my laugh the other day live. Oh, guys, that's a <laughs> private joke, but it's well, funny. You probably deserved it. You probably it's because I don't like dead air, so I'll just sit there and go. Ha 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 ha. And she calls me out on it. We're going to have to restart the show. The gorgeous and talented Kira has just arrived in the chat room, everyone. Here oh, are. okay. So we're going to have to re. re- look at this. Hey, all. Had work duties, had a long day, but finally home. There she is. The gorgeous Good Kira. See you, Kira. Uh huh. <laughs> she goes down to the E. Seti Ranch all the time at James Gilliland. She gets some amazing UFO photos there. Big Willie's cracking me up. I said, for only $5, you can take my spot and be Chad Smith for a night. He said, I already sent him $5. So you're gonna I'm, I'm going to have to send him the link. You're going to have to put a time limit on that for like five minutes or so or, or less. $5 for five minutes? Yeah. Sounds good. Five Canadian dollars for five minutes. Yeah, what's it? What? <laughs> Two and a quarter U.S.? <laughs> hey, leave the Canadian peso alone. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Hey, pretty soon ours not gonna be worth gonna be worth much more than a peso. Dave, how much time do we have? Uh, we have uh, two minutes. All right, I'll two be right minutes. Back. Chad Smith got to go poo quickly. Hi, Nicole Sackage. You can always tell the new ones. They tell you when they're gonna leave. Right. <laughs> hey, I'm out of here. <laughs> I I got I always have stuff going on. My dog is still crazy. He'll make an appearance before the night's done. And we want to give a shout out to PJ here. First time listening in. Swamp Dweller send him over. Thank you, Swamp Dweller. Hello. Sending PJ Yay. over. By the way, we got some good stuff coming in for Mr. Swamp Dweller here very soon. Yep. That's all I'll say. Tim F., welcome to this channel again. God, this is a good crowd tonight. Great crowd tonight. Well, look who you have on. 157. Uh, Hey, we got James F. and Goodall right here. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 the other legend, Michael Schratt. 
They don't come better than him. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Chad's back. I'm back. Are we going to talk about India? We will. We're going to get into John Ramirez first. I've never been to India. I received a couple of phone calls telling me that my packages in the mail were not very legal and that I was carrying my packages were found to have cocaine, heroin, and fentanyl in them. Sweet. And, 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 then, and then there was a warrant out for my arrest. Hold on. <laughs> We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. So please go there and hit subscribe as well. We're going to continue on with the SOR Roundtable. We do it near the end of each month where we talk about the strange month that was in the weird, the woo, and the Paranormal Supernatural. Joining us tonight, Michael Schratt and James Goodall, two of the best historic researchers on aviation in the United States. We have Sonny Conway from Paranormal Chop Shop. Make sure you go hit subscribe on his YouTube channel. Chad Smith is here, the Chad Smith. You can hit subscribe on his as well. Nicole Sackage, researcher, author, playwright. You know, she does it all. And, of course, John Hudson, the fedora-wearing one who hosts on this channel. We have the unidentified, or make that unbiased, UFO report. John, I want to start with you on this one, if you don't mind, because about a week, week and a half ago, we did a story on John Ramirez. He is a retired CIA officer who is just getting involved in the UFO field, as your microphone's on mute, and now he, he is saying that that we got to be prepared for alien hybrids and extraterrestrials walking among us. Yeah, he, he, um, so, um, so just, you know, in full, uh, in full disclosure, you know, I, I'm in, in, in a small chat group with, with John Ramirez and a few other people. And so I, I've been talking to John for a couple months. And so, uh, yeah, I, I can't say that I know him really well. Or he's a friend or anything, but he's, he's certainly a really nice, a uh, really nice guy who I, I've, I've enjoyed several conversations with and um and he you know a lot of his um a lot of his um, uh, methodology seems to be around trying to see what he can get redacted so he he very intentionally every slide he produces he sends to cia and he he specifically he specifically grades the content that he's going to send into the likelihood he thinks it's going to get redacted and he pushes his limits he he likes to have a certain amount of content in every slide that he thinks is going to get redacted and this last two times it's gone in nothing's got redacted and it's pissing him off and you can tell and so the fact that he has this kind of mindset that he's trying to see how far up to the edge he can push, you know, without getting into trouble and still get the serial numbers so he can, you know, get cover himself if, if someone, you know, calls him out on a presentation he does. Right. And and so and the fact that I think that a lot of his his um, motivation behind what he's doing is that, you know, he's had a lot of other friends who have had experiences themselves, either in or outside of, of work, who have no interest in coming forward because of the way they expected to be treated. 
And so part of what he's doing as well is, is trying to come out and saying, look, you know, I'm coming out, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm retired, but I'm coming out and, and, you know, I'm not being treated, you know, <laughs> too badly. And, um, and so, you know, hopefully setting a good example for other people to encourage other people with, with more information that he has to come out because a lot of information he's been coming out with hasn't been specific to any one event that he knows about. It's a lot of what he's been coming out with has just been super helpful. Hey, if you really want to, uh, you know, FOIA something, you know for 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 this type of information these are the groups you want to be doing that to don't send don't send that request to this group they're not going to know anything about it you know very practical stuff um really good presentation um very very impressed with them but um but you know like i said um you know just getting to know them can't say i know them well but but we'll, we'll say that i am somewhat biased and somewhat defensive of him and that, that i i do like john quite a bit John, I want to ask you in regards to Mr. Ramirez and and you having the opportunity to talk with him. You know, where where does he getting the information about aliens and hybrids walking among us, and it'll be natural in the future? Ah, uh, so so basically, um, you know, he he one of the things that John's really good about is he he divides his presentations up is to you know this is what um, this is what I I knew from when I was in. This is what I um, I can um, you know I, I knew about you know as a result of of trailing knowledge that existed from me departing, and then this is the information that I am um, I am speculating on based on all of my years of knowledge and all my years of experience and and you know blah blah blah. But I am speculating, right? And so this, the, you know, the, I, 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 I would need to go back and, and listen specifically to his, his wording when he was specifically talking about the hybrid section to be absolute sure. But my experience has been with everything he's been talking about in this realm. It's that he doesn't, he doesn't take anything that he's get any information he's given and immediately throw it out. Any information he's given, he puts on a, on a, in a gray box, right. And waits to see if there's some, ever supporting data for it. And so he ends up, you know, entertaining a lot of really, you know, really, you know, challenging, you know, hypotheses, and some of them end up being true. So I, you know, I think what he's, I think what he's saying is that, you know, if 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 you believe the evidence that's out there about these types of creatures, and no um, competing evidence arrives to say otherwise, and you and we continue to grow this lane of knowledge, then, in you know you should see something. And so I, th this, I think this is just part of his speculation part of it. I don't think it's based on anything. Um, you know, I mean, like I said, I have to go back and listen to it to be really sure, but historically he's been really clear to say that everything I'm saying when it comes to this kind of stuff, this is all speculation based on m my knowledge and what I learned when I was in there, but m not based on what I learned while I was in there procedurally operationally that sort of thing all right nicole i want to bring you in here We're talking about john ramirez you know i mean we have heard over the years so many different spooks come out of the of the closet so to speak to all of a sudden be information uh, gi givers to the ufo world whether it's about uap whether it's about government cover-ups and now about aliens and hybrids with John Ramirez. How do we take these former spooks or retired spooks seriously, considering when we know they are, they're still all under NDAs? You know, that's the biggest criticism someone like Luis Elizondo takes is his NDAs, all right? You know, Rick Doty comes to mind, and, and there's many others who have come forward over the years. So how do we take a new person like like John Ramirez and, and put some trust in his words. Um, I've kind of been on both sides of the fence of this. You know, I, I think when you're dealing with any of these people and you, you named Lou and Richard Doty and um, I off the top of my head over the last couple of years, I was thinking of D'Souza who's really come out with, um, ultra terrestrials. I believe he was with the FBI. So, I mean, this isn't anything that's new to our community or new to the field at all. And I think I'll fall back on what I usually think. And 
their testimony or what they're bringing to the field if it stands the test of time. I got to bow up for a second. Welcome to the community. So, yeah. I mean, we've even gone back and forth privately and a little publicly with our friend Bob McGuire and what he used to do. So, I mean, and whether or not he has intentions or not intentions or if he's still working or not working. And I think that's always like in the back of everybody's mind is, are they truly in our community because they're still curious and they want to find out more or are they some sort of like plant and they're still reporting in or they're still on the job, I guess you could say. So. Good comment from John Music in our chat room. Some people are being very skeptical of Ramirez because they say there's no hard evidence and he's so new. Not fair to him, but he still should be heard and talked to a lot more. What, what's your opinion of that, Nicole? I agree. I mean, it's often a stance I take with um, Mr. Doty. Everybody, you know, kind of crawls out of the woodwork and says, just shut him off. Nobody talk to him. He'll go away. And I'm always the opposite. I'm like, talk more. Keep him talking. Ask. <laughs> Everybody needs to talk to him more. Because I firmly believe the more people talk, the more they'll either trip up or they'll continue to tell the same story. And you know, over time, I think that gives validity. So I think the same with Ramirez. I think if we keep talking to him and he keeps sharing and, you know. Right. Time will tell. Sonny from Paranormal Chop Shop. Should, should we be trusting any type of spook? Or former spook? Um, Man, that's a hard one. For me, that depends on their terms they left on if they left because they got in trouble for saying something then yeah you should trust that guy you know maybe you should probably yeah yeah because if you got in trouble for saying something and then you get terminated for that it was probably something you weren't supposed to say so he's gonna maybe be mad and keep saying stuff but the ones that maybe retired i'd say let's say they retired from there maybe not those guys you know they might still be protecting who they worked for everyone especially if they're team players you know very true very true but i think the hard thing is you know for so long sonny these people you know made the commitment to protect the united states government and, and the military and its secrets for a lifetime and now all of a sudden we're supposed to believe them when they say trust me yeah yeah that's that's I have a hard time trusting them too, but that's why, that's why I say the ones that left on bad terms, maybe, maybe you can trust those ones, but the ones that didn't, those are like the team players. Like you said, they, they swore to keep those secrets and I think they will to their, to their grave. Chad Smith, would you like to rein in on this? I was just going to add in that. I think we like, Nicole was saying, I think we should just listen to them as much as we can and just keep drilling them with more questions because it seems like if they, if they are fake, then if you keep asking them enough questions, they're going to eventually back down or they're going to answer something the wrong way or you'll catch them at some point. But yeah, I don't think it's a good thing to, to uh, take them out of the equation because any information is good information, even if it's bad. And even if they come out to be fakes or spooks or whatever, I think you should just keep drilling them with more questions and see what they have. All and right. I'm Chad Smith. Thank you. Thank you. The Chad Smith, everyone. Okay. Uh, Michael Schratt, let's bring you in here, if you don't mind, my friend, because I really want to uh, get your opinion on this. I mean, you have seen this through your research where through NDAs, through interviewing people that you have been able to to see the 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 cleanliness from the dirt when it comes to the higher ups involved where the information lies uh, how are you responding to people like John Ramirez just coming out former CIA people like Luis Elizondo or Rick Doty now i'm not saying they're bad people what i'm saying is for a long time we weren't supposed to trust the spooks in this field. 
And now all mm-hmm. of a sudden, here we are having to put our, our faith in them for information. All I would say is, where is the physical evidence? Where is the gun camera footage? Where is the 8 by 10 glossy? Uh, where is the debris? Where are the bodies? Uh, the vaults where they keep this? We just need the physical evidence, regardless of what they say. Um, we've got to get something more concrete to move this field forward. Um, that's just been my my thought for so long, that we just can't have more CE1 or CE2 sighting cases. We, we've got to move this whole field forward and nothing short of physical evidence is going to do it no matter who it comes from. But Michael, in everything you've researched over the last couple of decades, do do you feel comfortable in getting UFO news from somebody whose job it was to poo poo this topic for their career? Um, I'm skeptical I think the best way to do it is have no single point failure. When you can interview three different people from three different locations and times, and they all describe the same thing, those things I think you can bank on. Um, I wouldn't just put all my eggs in one basket for one person. So that'd just be, that'd just be my policy, how I would run it. You know. All right. Yeah. Let's bring in Jim Goodall here for that same question. Jim, you have met a lot of, of smart people and you've met a lot of shady people in this entire field over the years. And, and we have talked about some of this behind the scenes and well off the record regarding everything for you. When, when you see somebody like John Ramirez come out, start talking aliens and hybrids, or you see Luis Elizondo explain that, you know, he would love to open up his mouth and open up his brain to the public, but can't because of his NDAs. But these are gentlemen who've been on the inside asking us to trust them at their word. How do we do that? Again, like Michael said, we, we, where's the beef, you know, to quote the old uh, Wendy's commercial way back when, where's the beef we need, we need something we can put our hands on something we can bite into. But along the same lines, I have a, I have a, a dear friend who works for the NSA been at Alice uh, Alice Springs, uh, you know, Pine was it Pine Gap, and when Tucker Carlson came on and said we we've been visited by craft not of this earth, and same with a, a supposed uh, someone from the federal government, I sent I sent him email out, email out. I said, hey, do you believe in UFOs? And I mean, within a second, I had a response. He says, why did you see one? I said, no. He said, she said, I can't talk. I can't, especially on this type of platform, but they're here. And I said, can you expand upon that? I said, no. But, you know, she's in the know. She, you know, she, would, she, she would know. And I trust her. I've known her for 15 years, 15, 18 years. But I haven't had a chance to, from that conversation to sit down with her when there's no recording devices, no one listening, no one listening in what she's saying. If you if you're dealing with security service, if you're dealing with NSA, virtually everything you say on a on a telephone call, or everything you you send out an email or a text or whatever, they see that's stored, and they have the computers. The computers are looking for keywords because they're monitoring everything, but they, they'll actually flag somebody who mentioned something about something that may be classified so you know the people that that had worked on it who had signed uh, non-disclosure agreements uh depending on 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 what kind of fight they want to want want to fight i think i think it's they would you know, like lou or some of the other people that supposedly were in on the inside if you just came out and blatantly said okay this is what i have Here's hard evidence. Even though you've signed the, the non-disclosure agreement, I think they would be hard pressed to fight you. They may they may try to discredit you, like they did with Bob Lazar. They did everything they could to make him look like a a, a sleaze bag, and he's and he's not. Uh, and as, again, my my friend from NSA, she want she wants to talk about it, but she's still you know, she's still employed, so she won't. But she did, yeah. She did indicate they're here. 
and I got to I and she has no reason to to lead me astray or to you know feed me information that was false. So I have to believe they're here. But you know, it's, there's just there's just been way too many uh, events happened that we know happened. We know it's been covered photographically uh, or on video. And it never goes anywhere. It disappears. A courier takes it to Washington, D.C. You never see it again. Uh, there has to be some, you know, someone on our side of the platform, if you want to call it that, that's willing to, you know, to stick his neck out or stick her neck out and produce some hard facts, some hard evidence. And, you, and, you know, I see all these videos and these pictures taken it's a pixel. Yeah. It may look like a triangle. It's moving around, but it's not. You don't have any. You don't have a stationary object to to use as a as a um, to determine how much that thing is moving around. And until until we get someone with really good glass, with a really good camera or a video camera that's you know, that's five you know five K or better, uh, or we you know or someone actually brings in a dead body of an of an alien and presents it you know to the public on a on a uh, open forum could be spaced out radio i mean it's it's only a matter of time i think i think we're getting i think we're getting close i think the world is has has gotten to a point where uh, disclosure has to happen and and, it's, and hopefully it'll happen before well, I'm still on this planet I think you're living forever. You you you've got that that gene, man. You're living forever. I may be at least a hundred. I know that. That's a lot of partying have, left. A lot of I have too many. I have too many family members that made it to 103, 105, 107. And yeah, I'm I'm you know, I'm going to be seventy seven pretty soon. <clears throat> I don't feel like it. I can go out. I can go out and. and and dance and party like like the young kids. Maybe not maybe not as long, but you have to well, live life. You have to enjoy it, and I and I do that every chance I get. And that is why you are a legend, my friend, a legend. Yeah, yeah. And everybody yeah. loves James Goodall. Everybody loves. Oh, James not everybody. I, I can name a couple ex wives that would, wouldn't say that. So <laughs> yeah, they don't count. They don't count. Yeah. I'm saying well, a couple in the of UFO. Them do. I'm saying in the UFO yeah. world. In the oh, UFO okay. world, we've got like two yeah. minutes to go, and uh, Nicole, I'm going to finish this segment off with you here regarding you know John Ramirez. Is this somebody you think, though, looking at everything that we need to pay attention to? Well, yeah, I mean, I I think everybody has an equal voice in our community, so yeah. I know. Do you have a book out yet? Let's let's buy the book. Is there a documentary yet? But I, mean, I have not looked into his his claims yet and what he said. And I should have from the other night, but I didn't. So at this point, I'm still very neutral on him. But yes, I say contribute to the conversation. The more, the merrier. The one thing I do like about him is he is going right at it. He's not saying that I have to hide behind my NDA. Like John said, he is challenging the NDAs. He's pushing them to the limits. Add to the fact that he's getting into ET life. I mean, this could be smoke and mirrors. This could be someone who figured, you know what? I did a lot of this. I can make some money off of television and book deals and and documentaries and the, and the conference tours. And maybe somebody like him could. Why not? He has the experience. And you know what? It's a secondary career for him, and by God, he's allowed to do it. Let's just hope for the sake of all of us, as we get ready to go to, for break here, that he's doing it on his own, for his own good heart. Let's put it that way. And let's hope that he can make a million dollars off of it, even though it's very rare to do that in this field. It's only been done by one person or two, I believe. But nonetheless, we're going to continue on with our three of the SOR Roundtable tonight. We're going to get into India next. What is going on in India with UFOs? We're going to hit up Nicole Sackage, the 
Chad Smith, Michael Schratt, James Goodall, two living legends in this field, Sonny from Chop Shop, and the fedora-wearing John Hudson when we return for Hour 3 of Space Out Radio next. All right, we're clear. Hello, this is your right, guitar so man, in Bumblefoot Thaw. <laughs> yeah. What's that? <laughs> so I'm not read up on the whole India situation. Neither am I. That's the beauty of this Don't show, be buddy. Shipping. Oh, get I out your you Google machine. I, the I, get I already did. I have a tab this. opened. Just says UFO India news. I'm trying. And, and I'm that learning. package you were talking about, was that a joke? <laughs> no. I said I, you just late, to ship drugs. Lately, I have been getting these, you know, these these uh, uh, phone calls that everybody gets from oh. usually the, the the officers of Pakistan where they're, they're saying they're police officers or they're they're a part of the Rev, uh, IRS or up here the CRA. Yeah. Well, now they're they're getting into Canada Post up here. All right, and they're saying uh, that uh, they've received a suspicious package with your name on it, and and you know the package when opened and tested saw that it was filled with cocaine, marijuana, and and uh, hash or pardon me heroin. And Damn. so I asked the guy the other day, because I'm literally getting one to two of these calls a day right now. And I asked the guy the other day, I said, I said, what the F are you doing with my heroin? Give it back. <laughs> and I got hung up on. <laughs> I try and play with them as much as possible. I do. I really enjoy it. The longest I've gone, I try and time how long I could go. The longest I've gone is 17 minutes. Oh, that's, man. that's good. 17 yeah. minutes is good. Mm -hmm. I, actually... I get the insurance ones. The my They tell me that my uh, auto warranty is about ready to expire and I need to renew it. And then I'll answer the phone and they ask, they ask what vehicle I drive. And I tell them it's a 69 Buick Electra to hang up on me. <laughs> <laughs> They're not even sure in that car. So I didn't know my warranty was I, up. I can't wait till the, the car's only fifty years old. I can't wait for the warranty ones to hit up here. They haven't hit here yet. Uh, I'm very much looking constant. Oh, Purpose and Grace says she's got one for Chad Smith. I don't know what that What's one that? is. What's she got? Hundred dollar bill? Hmm. Maybe the five dollar bill for five minutes of being Chad Smith. I'll take it. Maybe I found fake news earlier. I can't find it anymore. But I, I heard that India formed their own like government UFO department. And they were like, take that, Pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, maybe I dripped it. Purpose, you can forward any extra cash to uh, cashapp.com slash I'm Chad Smith. Hey, this is my show. You ain't hitting up my audience for your money. Uh, we'll take good care of it. <laughs> and put it to good use. We'll spend it in the SOR. Uh, you're gonna find shop. a way to get flagged when you're not even on your channel. Yeah, you're gonna get my <laughs> channel flagged. I'm gonna get blocked like NASA, like Sonny does on the NASA page. Yeah, they don't like me. They, <laughs> they don't. After like the show, jokes. can we go to the NASA channel and just, I don't know, send a bunch of. What were you telling them, Chad? Posse up? They didn't. In the NASA chat? not have nothing to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I was trying really hard not to get blocked. <clears throat> like someone I know. Yeah, I know. Oh, no jokes there. It's no jokes over in NASA. Oh, cut the music, please. I did. I did. Bad. It was a commercial. Sorry. Bad. Sorry, sorry. I'm looking. I'm looking. It was a commercial for Spaced Out Radio. I know. I know. <laughs> I can't find that story either, Nick. I can't either. It, it's gone. I saw it this afternoon and I was like, that'll be good round table talk. And now it's gone. Maybe, maybe, because I heard something about that. Maybe you're having a Mandela effect. Maybe. Maybe they took it back. <laughs> right? 
Oh, here, but here, P- Pentagon creates. Oh no, this is just in the Times of India talking about the Pentagon movement. <laughs> the Lazarus Pro- <laughs> Lazarus Project. He'd pay five do- five dollars an hour for an interview where we just prank call people. <laughs> Sonny, is, I know what we're doing tomorrow. That is something Goodall would do. We'll we'll bring Goodall on. You used to be able to crank call people. You can't do that anymore. Hey, this is Jim Goodall. <laughs> we're contacting you today about your car insurance, your car warranty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim's muted. We're probably missing out on some yeah, gold right on. now. Oh. Hold on, let me get him off there. Okay, sorry, Jim. Am I unmuted? Yeah, your go, your go for lunch. Oh, okay, okay. No, no. We used to, yeah, we used to you know call someone up just random and says, "Is your is your refrigerator running?" <laughs> yeah, I said, well, you better go catch it. Or... <laughs> I, that's what you do when you're 12 and 13 years old and you're bored and there's yeah. no such thing as the internet and there's no such thing as cell phones and there's no such thing as any of the stuff that today's kids have. And my doggy is giving, is looking around like she wants to do something. Is that that's, right? Okay. Scarlett? Okay, guys, we're going to put y'all on mute. We're going to get going here uh, momentarily. Thank you to all of our super chatters tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you to our new listeners. Hi, Magnus, in our chat room. And here we go, everyone, with the show. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Panmanesia. Panmanesia is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on through the top of the hour. It's the Paranormal Roundtable, where we bring in a bunch of really cool people who are from around the communities, and we talk about the subjects that really lit up the last month. Yeah, it's a good show and a great panel. We have legends in UFO and U.S. military aviation, James Goodall and Michael Schratt. We have Sonny from Paranormal Chop Shop, Nicole Sackage, researcher and author, John Hudson from the Unbiased UFO Report, and the Chad Smith from the Chad Smith Podcast. And we're going to go off to countries around the world here because as loud as the United States is being about UFOs right now. And this has become, over the last couple of years, a very hot-button topic. We haven't seen a lot of other countries, whether it's Canada, India, the United Kingdom, France, or any other ally, even countries like Russia, talking very much about the entire UFO subject. Why has this become such an American thing to do? And, John, I want to start with you on this one, bud if you don't mind, in regards to this topic. Because it seems like the rest of the world really doesn't give a care. They're all reporting on what's happening in the United States and UFOs, but nobody's asking their own government, hey, what do we know? 
No, and and I think I think part of it is you know I think part of this is historical. I think it, I think a lot of this is because of of when a lot of this this policy emerged. Um, were was were around at the same time that you had things like um Roswell happening and so forth, and so you had a lot of these things kind of co-emerging as far as the formation of different agencies and so forth, and and so I think that you what you really have is you have you have an artifact of 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 essentially the Cold War where you had essentially, you know, um, Southern, um, you know, or Eastern Bloc type countries where if they received a crash of some sort and they were part of a larger, you know, um, uh, communist, you know, organization, it would get sucked up into that organization. If they weren't, if they were an adjacent organization, they would call into the highest ranking Soviet local group and let them know about the crash and hopefully win favor for turning that crash in right same thing would happen with u.s you know satellite countries right you had south american countries that we had numerous reports of essentially you know a crash happening the local military cording it off and then the u.s military showing up and them being the ones that actually take over the site clean it up remove all the material and get out of there as if there's some sort of an agreement and this was even really alluded to in um an episode of um unidentified with um with elizondo where he was talking to some of the south america south american countries and what agreements they had in place with the u.s government and so i think that in some cases you have countries that had prearranged agreements i think, I think in some cases you had governments that were would didn't have prearranged agreements but would take crashes as bargaining chips to favor uh, influence with us or with with another country and so i think in the long short of it is is that none of that results in there being any benefit to going public about any of this information for anyone else except for us right it, and and even for us it's questionable i don't really i, I don't really know how beneficial it really is for everyone if they're talking about it but at least here you can argue there is some benefit for it because if you want to build an industry around it you need to start talking about it right Whereas I think, you know, everywhere else there's until like no, no one else, no one else believes they're going to build an industry around this technology until we do it first, essentially. Right. And so it, it, a lot of this is, is just kind of a weird chicken before the egg type situation where, um, you know, it's 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 just but, you know, it, it is just a matter of time. Well, I, I would hope it would be time because I know that members of the Canadian government are talking about it behind the scenes. But nobody is willing to go public with it. James Goodall, let's bring you in here, my friend, uh, for this topic, because I'm very curious about why you think that we haven't seen the rest of the world start jumping on the UFO UAP bandwagon like we have with the United States. I mean, just a month and a half, two months ago, we saw this get into the House of Lords on the floor for topic. And the defense minister of England basically said, yeah, we're not talking about this topic. We don't have time to talk about this topic. They hammered her with questions for almost two hours. And the minister of defense for England literally shut them down every chance that opposition got. So why are, uh, why do you think other countries are so meek when it comes to talking about the UAP phenomena? I mean, we're just you know, our country is just now starting to talk about it with you know with uh, some regularity. I, I but again, I don't I don't think we're the ones that are in charge of disseminating the information. I I I honestly believe that it's them, whoever them you know they may be. And to quote the Israeli uh, uh, UFO researcher. We're not ready for it yet. I mean, when I go outside, I here here in, and I know Dave where you live. It's when it's dark. It's dark out there. But here in uh, the community I live in, we don't have any street lights. So you go out in the backyard, even the, in the front yard, it is dark. And I was, I was out there last night looking up and said, "What would my reaction be right now if all of a sudden, right in front of me, there was a gray or a reptilian or or a flying saucer, a UFO, what would my reaction be? And I wasn't quite sure I wouldn't be, I don't think I'd be terrified, but it's, I don't know. I just, we're not ready for it. That's, that's basically what I, I, I believe in the, uh, 
And I'm sort of rambling right now. That's okay. What do you think, Michael? Uh, well, you'd think that over 75 years would be enough, you know. But to, to answer the question, the reason why it's so prevalent in America is for two reasons. Number one, it's entered pop culture American icon status. That's number one. Number two is that the intelligence communities are pushing the giggle factor on the mainstream media with regard to this subject matter. That's why it's so prevalent in America. And then getting back to the crash retrieval that we were talking about earlier, uh, I want to highlight one retrieval operation that I think is significant because it has a tie-in to the 41 Cape Girardeau uh, crash retrieval. So I want to just set the site picture here. It's December 1963. It's literally a few weeks after Kennedy was assassinated on November 22nd, 1963. In fact, Kennedy may have actually have seen this craft. I can't prove it. And I've always wanted to know, what did Kennedy know? When did he know it? And who did he tell? Those are the questions that I want to I wanna get answered. All right. So uh, December 1963, this Marine is called out of bed at the dead of night. And he's told to board a plane with blacked out windows. They depart at night from Cherry Point, North Carolina. They fly approximately three and a half hours from Cherry Point, uh, North Carolina, to an undisclosed location that even he didn't know where it it was. Could have been a Navy facility. So there's that naval tie-in again. The U.S. Navy is in back of all this. It could have been an Air Force facility. We don't know. He goes to this hangar or this large building, and these hangar doors open up, and what he sees when he looks inside that hangar is a 40-foot diameter dish-shaped craft that's about 15 feet tall. The entire exterior has this highly, highly polished chrome metallic exterior configuration, and this is essentially a fat hamburger. It has nine elliptically shaped opaque windows wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft. And there's a one inch lip between the outside exterior part of the craft and the outside of the opaque window. He mentioned that there was this lip there. And then near the bottom of the craft, he said that there was a seam. And the seam or entry hatch to this craft was so fully integrated into the craft itself you could not put a razor blade into this seam. It was so uh, perfectly integrated. Now, what they did next is his job was to guard this flying saucer in this hangar for a period of two weeks. And this was relayed to Leonard Stringfield. And this is by way of a gentleman who I spoke to who actually interviewed the Marine. I was able to speak to the gentleman who interviewed the Marine, but I, I have not been able to track down the Marine myself. Now, I do know his first and last name, and I know where he lived back in 86. He said that they had built scaffolding, and they had propped this flying saucer up on scaffolding, and then they built a catwalk around this entire thing so that you could have these white lab coat technicians who are trying to breach the hull of this craft, they were they were able to walk under it and walk around it. Now, he also mentioned that they were trying to breach the hull of this craft, and they tried three separate uh, avenues to enter. Number one, they had a diamond tip drill bit that they were trying to breach the hull, and they actually put this drill bit right in the seam of the entry hatch. And I've got a map here that shows you all the attempted points of entry. Now, that failed. Second thing they did is they took an acetylene torch to this thing, and they put it on the skin of the craft, had no effect whatsoever. Then the third thing is they brought in two 18-wheeler tractor trailers with this large electrical power device on it. They, They both had about three inch thick electrical cables that went from these 18 wheeler tractor trailers and they were all, they fed through into the hangar up to this craft itself. And they had a laser device. They were shining the laser on the skin of the craft when they moved the laser away. And this is all back in December, 1963, they moved the laser away and it was warm to the touch, but had no effect whatsoever on the craft itself. Now, it gets a little bit more interesting. He also mentioned that there was a white circle painted on the concrete floor of this facility, and his job was to shoot to kill anyone who tried to breach 
that circle. And there was a U.S. Navy admiral who got within a few seconds of getting shot because he had just about breached, um, breached that circle. There was one time that was relayed by this Marine. He was in this facility with the craft alone just one time. He had a small Minox camera and he took a photograph of this craft propped up on the scaffolding. Unfortunately, back in 83, there was a flood where he was living. That photograph was lost. And on the, on the last day that he guarded this thing, he said that they were putting it on an, a low boy tractor trailer. They were putting a tarp over the craft and then they put chains over the tarp and they were moving, moving it to the next location. Now, while all this was going on, he did hear something to the effect that bodies were recovered and one was still alive. Okay. So to, to continue with the story, we were talking about Charlotte Mann and the Cape Girardeau retrieval of 41. Charlotte Mann was good friends with a man named four-star major general Melvin F. McNichol. He was the base commander at Tinker Air Force Base. And he was good friends with Charlotte Mann. They both had a interest in UFOs. And so Charlotte came to the general and said, General, uh, we have this mutual interest in UFOs. Why haven't you told me anything? Are you still my friend? And so this general turns to Charlotte Mann, and she mentioned this at the IUFOC in Phoenix about two years ago. General turns to Charlotte and says, Charlotte, if you ever repeat ever repeat what I'm about to tell you, I'll deny it and it could ruin my career. So he told her, he told her that number one, he did see a flying saucer. This is from the general and it was located in the West. Then he said that the, the whole flying saucer was propped up on scaffolding and they built catwalk around this thing. This is exactly what the Marine had just talked about. Then he said that there were, at least three bodies were recovered and one was still alive. This is very similar to, the, to what the Marine had said. So when I heard this from Charlotte Mann, I thought, wow, I've really got a case because we've got two separate individuals confirming virtually the identical case separated by time and space. And so I thought, wow, there's something here. Ta-da. That's heavy, Michael. That is, that is very heavy. Nicole, uh, you know, when you hear Michael drop some serious bombs like that about what's going on behind the scenes with everything, I mean, how, how do we as a public react to that? How should we react to that kind of news? That's loaded. I don't. I can't think like a normal person in the general public anymore. <laughs> I get riled up when I hear the secrecy, the blatant secrecy. But is there a more direct question you want to ask me? No, <laughs> I kind of that, 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 that kind of was my question. I, I could kick it yeah. back though. I could kick it, back. kick it back. All right, <laughs> John Hudson, bring you in here because uh, Chad Smith is too busy looking pretty on camera right now. It's just you know he, he's all googly eyed, you know, right now, but. John, we'll get you in here because we we really want to. Uh, have a nice background. Yeah, he does have a nice background. He does have a nice work. With, with what Michael is saying, you know about what's being hidden and what's what really is the game plan behind the scenes here. How much are we really just seeing the 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 tip of the iceberg with the knowledge that's really going on behind closed doors? Oh, I, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, what will we'll, sliders might get adjusted. You're, you're always going to have these, these sliders that occur. Like, you know, you take, for example, um, you'll take like, you know, like little like attributes that you'll hear people talk openly about, um, say like the, um, F 22 program, what you'll do find if you dig a little bit was that was actually something being said about like the f-117a program and so you know very often like like little attributes little things about certain programs certain planes certain certain technologies they get they they often don't come out till later and they come out attached to, to the wrong plane and they come out attached to the wrong technology but they do eventually come out 
And so you have this these lags that occur where, you know, there's like this, you know, maybe it's 20 years, maybe it's 50 years, whatever it may be, where these technologies kind of, you know, evolve and come and so forth. And so essentially this, te- you know, this kind of mass technology infusion that might result from a from a recovered craft might shift this um, might might shift this this balance might um, extend one of these periods might shorten one of these periods might create bigger periods but you're still going to end up with the same sort of overlap because the at the end of the day the u.s military still wants to have at least a 50-year lead on every other country on earth and that's just that's just that's just policy so i mean until that policy's changed you're always going to have some window where the coolest you know sexiest stuff is going to be hidden and it's only going to be the stuff later on that actually gets out right on right on let's go over to uh jim goodall here you know i mean when, when you and michael talk the the information is just so heavy jim it it really is and and i mean that to be ex- extremely complimentary to the hard work that you two have done regarding this have you ever when when you hear michael talk and i know michael is like a son to you you're like a father they to talk him about baking and they just talk about baking all day and yeah and, i'm sure and they talk crazy. about baking and and you know what oh, yeah. what to yeah. put in a good mimosa and everything like that but right, right. but when you get information that is so in depth like what with michael was just saying how how do you just sit there and take it for what it's worth by without dropping your jaw and saying you got to be you got to be serious here well first of all no one does it better than michael nobody i don't care who it is and I've, I've known Michael with 20 some odd years yeah. longer. Yeah. But the first time I ever saw him give a presentation was at uh, the function that, that I met you at in uh, San Francisco in, in 2020, March 2020. And I was, I mean, I've always enjoyed, you know, Michael's stuff. I, I no one I say no one does digs in it to it any deeper than he does. And I was blown away. I was not many people. I'm not impressed by a lot of people, but I was really impressed by Michael and, and what he had. I mean, and the stuff he had and the documentation he had to support what he was saying. So, I mean, I, I, I absorb all this in. I, I, I've never, I never started out as a, as a UFO person. I'm a hardware person. I'm a person who likes to snoop into government to see what, what kind of G whiz airplane they're going to be flying next, or yes. what kind of special project they're doing. And, but that inter- that area of interest just sort of came together with things that go bump in the night mm-hmm. and UFOs. I mean, I'm interviewing General Gatlin. He's talking about chasing UFOs in an F- F-94. I'm interviewing Dave Fruhoff. He's talking about chasing a UFO in an SR-71. It's just, they just sort of go hand in hand with each other. And, and maybe it's because of the type of people I hang around with. You know, all my wives have said, you don't have any normal friends. And I have to agree with her. Normal people are really boring. <laughs> they are. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know a couple of people that out there that they're, they're like a white box with black lettering on it at the store is there. There's nothing, there's nothing to their personality. There's nothing to what they do in life. They exist. I want, I've always wanted to do more than exist. I, I've always loved to push the envelope and I've always, I've been referred to that. Well, that's some bitch good all he's at it again. Um, and even, even my bosses in, in the air force and the air guard would, would say the same. They just shake their head. Oh God, good all's at it again. Um, and it's it's I know I absorb I love it I, I live I live I live for information and I'm and I'm, and I'm an information sponge but when it comes to when it comes to digging it digging in military aircraft I'm I'm incredibly good at it when it comes into digging into uh, previous UFO events no one does it better than Michael I agree and so with we're you, you know we're 
we're we're a fairly good we're a fairly good team. We're like the dynamic duo. I'll be Batman, you be Robin. Okay. I, I guess I know. You know I be Abbott. We got to go to commercial I'd be here. Be we got to yeah. go to commercial here, but I will say this: if you ever want to embarrass Michael Schratt, give him a compliment. It's yes. the greatest thing. It's the greatest thing. Yes. Michael Schratt, James Goodall, Chad Smith, Nicole Sackage, Sonny Conway, and John Hudson. we got another half an hour left in Space Out Radio's roundtable. We're going to go the distance right after this. And we're clear. I'm getting butt sprung. I've been doing this for hey, six Space hours. Hey, Radio fans. It's today. I know you. I hear you. Six hours. I hear you, man. Yeah, because oh. it was three hours. It was three hours with uh, Sunny, or two hours and forty-five minutes, and now it's going to be three hours here. <laughs> this is my third gonna... time on Space Out Radio in a week. I feel like I'm having deja vu. Like <laughs> Lincoln, everybody else is different. <laughs> Jim, don't Very forget you have a. You have, Jim, don't forget you have an invitation to the after party. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'm up for it. You, you need to know where I'll be there. You know Don't worry, Dave pays us a lot, Jim. You should be getting a check in the mail. Oh, you, you know how you funny after parties are. Yeah. Look at that glorious face. Isn't that beautiful? There's got to be where to get all off, our subscribers come from right there. <laughs> now, if he had blonde hair and he shaved his beard off and he had a little striped shirt, he looked like Charlie Brown. <laughs> Charlie Brown. <laughs> That's my new icon. I'm gonna have to change it. I'm gonna, work on, I'm gonna have to work on that. I'm gonna work on that, Jim. <laughs> I, I consider that to be a request. That's yeah, a get working on it, John. Get working on it. I'm sure. I, see things, that people, I see things that other people can't see. I guess That's I don't know. That, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. It'll be on the Facebook page in the morning. I'm sure it'll be a beautiful. Yeah. Thing. Take yeah. notes. Oh, All right. Gosh. So let, let's get an opinion here during the break here. What do y'all think of Dave's new mustache and, and chin hair here? Let's be honest. Woo! Clean shaven I love on it. the sides. Oh, you, did, you did a whack job on that. I did. I love it. Uh, Look th- at those cheeks. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love yep. it. This is what it's all about. Needed something yeah, if you different. Didn't, if you didn't have the hair on your head and your face, we wouldn't know who you were. True. <laughs> True. Had to try. Know, when I, had to try something different tonight. When when my when my son was six months old, I had a mustache for twenty some odd years, and I had shaved it. I had a cold, so I just shaved it off. And I came home from work, and and my son was in. You know, he was in his crib. He could hear his daddy's home. And he's jumping up and down. And I walk into the room, and he just he burst into tears. Here's something or somebody that sounded like his dad. Oh, but yeah. that caterpillar under his nose is gone, and he wouldn't. It was almost two days, and and he wouldn't have anything to do with me. And that's my baby. That's 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 my that's my son James. I mean, I just so I I actually got some. I immediately started growing, but I got some highliner from my wife and and covered my nose, and he sort of looked at me with a, <laughs> yeah, with a jaunty eye, saying, uh, uh, "It sound like my dad." You look a little bit like him, but that caterpillar under your nose is fake. You pulled a fake Derek. Oh, yeah. That's what you did. I've never seen my father without a mustache. Ever. (laughs) Ever? Me neither. Ever. My dad, uh, in the 60s, when his uh, grandmother, or either his grandmother or grandfather was about to pass away, and he, uh, no, it was his grandmother, and she loved him with a mustache. Thought he looked so cute. So but she asked my dad to keep his mustache. And so my dad has always kept his mustache. <clears throat> That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I, I shaved mine off because it was, it turned pure white. I don't know what that is. I know like. I have white. I know I have white on the top of my hair, but this, this would just, this is just pushed, pushed me over the edge. And I just said, no. I gotta, I gotta be disco gem, so I gotta. Uh, no, it's, it's one of the beautiful things it. about being a guy. Is it like just depending on what age frame you're in? If you need to look a little older, you grow the beard. 
If you need to look a little younger, you shave it off again. You need to look a little older, grow yeah. it back. You need to look a little bit younger, shave it off again. <laughs> you, have a, you have all these different age right. frames where, where your beard is different colors and different thicknesses, where you can bring it in and bring it out, depending on what, how much influence you want to have over your age. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful tool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I just, I just, I, sh- I shaved it because I started looking too much like my grandfather, my Sicilian grandfather. And- just, a, just a quick update here. I was sent this, a great picture here. Hold on. Where am I? Sent <laughs> oh, a no. wonderful picture here. You know, I don't know where we got this, but we're going to put it up here just for a quick second. There he is. <laughs> I get that out of here. Yeah, there, there he is. That is Chad Smith with his five head. I'm taking Big Willie's wrench away. He doesn't have a forehead. He has a five head in that photo. Um, yeah. Big thank you to Coral, Cat Chaser, Third Phase, Mark, Tim, Fabster, John, Phil, Jenny, Willie times two, Swamp Dweller times two, Chad. And uh, Thomas, Apollo, Chris, and Apollo again for the super chats. Really do appreciate it. And it's a great way to support what we do on this show. Hello, veteran Black Dragon. Good to have you here. Here we go, everyone. Round of third, we're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. We want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read Shirky Poo is Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. For the final time tonight, we introduce the panel of the SOR Roundtable. We have Nicole Sackage, researcher and author from the Paranormal Chop Shop, Sonny Conway. He's looking badass tonight. We have two great historians when it comes to aviation. I think they are the best in North America. Michael Schratt, James Goodall from the UAP Report here on Spaced Out Radio, John Hudson, and the Chad Smith from the Chad Smith Podcast. And I want to get into stories here for a second, guys, because, James, right before the break, you kind of teased us, James Goodall, about about the SR-71 pilot chasing a UFO. When did this happen? Uh, it was in. He was flying the SR seventy one out of Kadena, Okinawa. It was late seventy two, early seventy three. He was on a night training mission. At he was flying at seventy eight thousand feet at Mach two point about two point seven, two point eight. That's sort of a sweet spot to get there fast, but you don't over you don't thermally stress the systems by going to Mach three point two. And it was about 11.30 at night. He's going in a straight line, about a three-quarter moon. And off to his uh, port side, his left side, was a three-quarter moon. And all of a sudden, he gets, he through his peripheral vision, he gets something metallic glinting off the, off the light from the moon. It's about five or six miles off to his right, and probably six or 7,000 feet above him. And he thought maybe it was another SR-71. So he contacted on Secure Voice, the command post at Kadena, Okinawa. And they said, no, you're up there by yourself. He said, no, I'm not. I got company, so I'm going to go take a closer look. So he advances the throttles. Now, the Blackbird likes to fly fast, really fast. And we're talking about 50 years ago to go 2,100 miles an hour. So he's advancing the throttle. He's never taking his eye off the object. In about a 10-degree bank, he starts climbing. His backseater gets on the intercom and says, hey, Dave, we have company. I said, yeah, we do. I'm going to take a closer look. And he said when he was about a couple thousand feet below it and still a mile or so away from it, this thing took off and left him in the dust like he was heading the other direction. He figured the 
uh, it left him between eight and you know, about 8,000 miles an hour, what he, what he figured. It moved that fast. And he lost track of it going between 180 and 200,000 feet. Now, this is 1972. The Vietnam War was still hot and heavy. And a vehicle unknown to, any, you know, to, you know, to Dave or anybody else leaves him in the dust. So fast forward to 1980. He retires from the Air Force. He gets a job as facility manager at Area 51, and he knew and he knew a lot of the guys that were there because when you when you're in the spooky community, you, stay, you pretty much stay in it. So after he was after he was there for a while and he, and he felt comfortable with it, he started asking around, "Do we have anything that will will leave an SR-71 in the dust?" And everybody he talked to, actually everybody said, "Well." It wasn't flown here. We didn't build it here. We didn't do anything here. So what he had, he, ch- he was chasing a UFO in and out and ran him. And it's just, I mean, it was, it was, it was when I, when he, when I asked him about it, he said, when you, when he, I asked him if he knew, if he believed in UFOs, that's when he said, yeah. And he went, then he told me about his story. And I just, we need more people like that. Now, there, there are, there are, uh, pilots out there, both commercial and military, that have had first-person encounters with things they can't explain. And I gotta I gotta believe that in today's world, I'm talking about you know 2022, 2021, and you know, today's you know, right now, the cameras we have on our cell phones are, are second to none. And I'm just waiting, I'm waiting for some you know, for somebody to violate their company or their military's protocols and just say, screw it. I'm not going to go through any, anybody at, at work or at, at, at the base. I'm going to go right to, Oh, spaced out radio or someplace, you know, someplace similar to show the world, Hey, we're not alone. Can you explain this? And, and then I, then I sort of fall back onto what Ben Rich told me just before he died. And those who didn't, didn't know who Ben was, Ben was, he replaced Kelly Johnson as the president of the Lockheed Skunk Works. And we were friends for a quarter of a century. And Ben, ben said, I've already said it once tonight, but he said, we have things out in the desert that's 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. And we were talking earlier about stuff we see today is old hat. It's, you know, it was developed 20 years ago. What we have today, you're not going to see for another 20 or 50 years. And that maybe that's what he was talking about. But he said, we have things, you know, we have things out there that are 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. And if you've seen movies like Star Trek or Star Wars, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. I said, Ben, you want to expand upon that? He said, no, which is very typical of Ben Rich. And then he had the nerve to die on me 10 days later. So oh, I never get it. Did have a chance to interview him in you know, in in detail about what had transpired in his fifty some odd years in aerospace. Right, Michael Shred. I want to bring you in here if you don't mind regarding this because you have done a lot of work regarding secret military craft, and you have talked in many of your lectures about the SR program going up to like an SR seventy five, I believe the Aurora program. What is really flying out there that we have no clue is actually in airspace that is man-made? Um, I really have to stay close to my historical UFO cases, and I will relinquish that question to Jim. Well, they, they're, 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 they've been talking on, on the news that uh, we have an SR-72 a Mach six, Mach five, or Mach six airplane. Now people say, "Well, gee, that's that's pretty that's pretty outrageous." In 1982, Kelly Johnson, the founder of the Skunk Works, you know, the you know, he was the Leonardo da Vinci, the uh, Nikola Tesla, and the Albert Einstein of aviation. He had no peers. He was a he was a one off. But at, I was at it was Engineering Week in Minneapolis for uh, Honeywell Military Avionics Group. And the director of engineering invited me to the to the banquet to listen to 
hear their keynote speaker, which was Kelly Johnson. And Kelly said, speed costs money. He said, we have the ability today. Right now, we're flying at Mach 3.2 on the Blackbird. But we can go to Mach 4. We can go to Mach 6. We can go to Mach 8. We can, fl- we can build something today and go to Mach 12, Mach 16. Speed costs money. How fast do you want to go? And that's also a, that's also a drag racing uh, comment, too. Speed costs money. And if you throw enough money in it, and this is 1982, he was saying that we have the ability to fly a manned air-breathing platform in our atmosphere at Mach 16. And what's Mach, what's Mach 16? It's got to be, what, 12, 13, 14,000 miles an hour? I mean, that's, that's, really, that's really cooking with gas. So the, he, you know, he was a visionary. Before the, before the A-12 uh, and, the, and the SR-71 was developed, in 19, I think it was 56 or 57, he stated that the, the U-2 will become vulnerable you know, with, you know, within a year or two. And then um, uh, May 1st, 1960, they shot down Francis Gary Powers. And he predicted, he predicted then that the replacement for the U-2 would be a platform that flew between Mach 3 and Mach 4, between 80 and 120,000 feet. And that's the environment that the SR-71 and the A-12 Blackbird flew in. So he was predicting what was going to be, what was going to happen 10 years or five years out. Uh, and when he talked in 82 about going to Mach 16, there's no reason why we, there's no reason why we can't have a man-made craft flying that fast. Do we have one? Yeah, I believe we do. And I believe it's, it's been, been referred to as Aurora. I, I was at the fence line, the north fence line at uh, Area 51 outside of Rachel. You know, this is 92, 93 time frame. And John Andrews and I were going out of the back door of the, of the little alien. We're going to our, tra- our luxury suite, which is a single wide. And we heard this noise. It was so loud that you could be clinically deaf and have no, you know, no auditory nerves, and you could feel the pulsing on your body, which we believe was the aurora and the donuts on the rope. Uh, about three weeks later, I'm, uh, I have John Lear's truck. I'm parked on the, on the road to the, you know, that goes outside of Rachel. I'm not trying to hide anything, but I'm in there. I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping, and one of the pay comes comes down. Down and, and tries to screw up, uh, you know, blow dust all over John's truck and, and knock his antennas off the top of his truck. And about ten minutes after that, you know, they figured out I was going to be leaving. There was this the same the same incredibly loud pulse detonation type noise. It was eighteen miles away, and they were flying. It appeared to be F fifteens and F sixteens in the air, going in and out of burner to try to mask this incredible sound coming out from the Aurora or whatever, you know, what, what, what are you shaking your head for? Yeah. The Chad Smith. <laughs> so, I mean, not at you, Jim, Dave just keeps putting me up there. Oh, okay. Okay. But I mean, I had, I had a NASA guy ask me, he said, Hey, I, I didn't think they had any, I didn't think the XB 70 was flying. I said, well, there's only one of them left and it's, it's at the Air Force Museum. I said, no, but I've been seeing this big white uh, Delta aircraft with canards, you know, flying, you know, flying over the desert, you know, outside of Edwards, really quite high. But when you have visibility unlimited, even if you're at 50,000 feet, you can make out the airplane. And I believe that's the mother airplane, the SR-75, that the tester model company developed by John Andrews came out with back in the 90s. Along with their SR, along with their XR7 penetrator, which was the Aurora, and that's the one that Ben Rich was criticizing He's, when he said, "You know, I'm disappointed in John's Aurora model." I said, "Why is that?" He said, "Well, Mach 12 airplane fueled by liquid methane." Now, I never said Mach 12. 
I never said fuel by liquid methane. It would, you know, said you'd have to, you'd have to have an internal volume at least four or five times the size of John's model. So what Ben Rich told me is Aurora is fueled by liquid methane and flies at Mach 12. So what do you, what do they do? Just pull up to the closest farm, fill up on cow, cow poo, and then uh, go right back up in the air or what? No, you, uh, air refueling a cryogenic fuel is probably less dangerous than the old JP4, which was like trying to air refuel liquid dynamite. Um, but it's, it's, it's no big thing to, to air refuel liquid hydrogen or liquid methane or whatever propellant they want to use. Well, they would then have so, to have their own specialized KC-135s or KC-10s for refueling, right? Right. It's just like the SR-71 family had the KC-135Qs. They had a separate isolated fuel system that that carried their JP-7. And JP-7 is a... Oh, Nicole has her finger up. I can't you hear did. you. I, I wanted to ask a question real quick. Um, because the Chinese have been in the news lately with their supersonic um, jet that they have. Is it a jet? Am I saying that right? But I was wondering at what speed do these machines lose their maneuverability? As in, like, I think these supersonic ones pretty much can just go in a straight line, right? They can't zig and zag. Otherwise, they lose structural integrity. Right. I mean, you, you are you are limited by the laws of physics as far as a conventional platform is concerned. You know, the SR-71, it, you're flying at 3,400 feet per second. That's three miles every two seconds. No, two miles every three seconds, excuse me, or 43 wow. miles a minute. I mean, going from L.A. to, from LA to uh, Washington, D.C. in 47 minutes mm-hmm. on its retirement flight. Uh, the, the SR-71 and any craft that would be operating in the same environment, you're limited to about one and a half Gs as far as the, the force in turning and banking. An SR-71 at Mach 3.2 takes 180 miles to do a 180. Because wow. you, you just can't stress the airframe. Now, at a, an air show in, in England, at, at, it was, I think it was Green and Common, an SR-71 out of uh, uh, Mildenhall, the airplane had just come out of depot. It was fresh. Everything is new. There was a young SR-71 pilot, not necessarily age-wise, but as far as in the program. And he's flying over this air show. You know, it was the air, uh, the uh, international air tattoo, as they call it. It's a big gathering of aviation military aircraft in England. And the guy did it, probably pulled about three or four G turn. I mean, a tight burnt bank. You could hear the bolt heads popping off the 715 splice. Wow. On the airplane. <laughs> you could hear it on the ground. It was a bang, 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 bang. So immediately, hey, abort. Land, you know, get back to Milton Hall instantly. So they brought a crew out from Palmdale. They went up into the uh, the, the fuel tank where this where the joint is, and it, sure enough, he popped the heads off of, uh, half a dozen of these titanium bolts. I mean, they're big. Yeah. So That's they said, awesome. so we have to fly. We have to fly it back to Palmdale to fix it. So the uh, <laughs> the, the test pilot, the test, the test pilot said that. Well, as long as we don't, as long as we don't exceed it, you know, one and a half G's, we'll just fly it back at Mach three point two, and that's what they did. <laughs> uh, but the air, the airplane, the airplane structurally cannot take something. You know, can, can't take. Right. I'm just think. I'm my mind is wandering to like the accounts of um, the Tic Tac that started spiraling, you know, and then like shot off at such great speed and. I was just trying to maybe compare that to something known in our arsenal that can go that speed and also zig and zag or corkscrew up and down. So, 
It's amazing. You know, the, you know, the, the SR-71 was flying at 2,100 miles an hour mm-hmm. in the mid-1960s. That's a long time ago. Wow. But technology, you, you, technology has not, didn't, didn't stop with the development of the Blackbird. Right. And I, you know, and I got to believe that the, the, the follow-ons to, the, to that program led to Aurora and could have led to the Tic Tacs. And, it's, and the Tic Tacs, in some of the maneuvers they're making, it's, it's not out of the question to be able to do that. Right. But they may not be manned. They may be, they may be unmanned platforms. And that's that can, that's the second place my mind goes is, you know, we were just talking about man craft. And if we spin this into just the military's drone program, I mean, that's amazing. I know drones can reach faster speeds than most people think. <laughs> well, we the Lock, Lockheed had a had a drone that we that we flew over China in the late 1960s, early 1970s. It was called the D-21 it was uh, the program was called tag board and the time it was being developed it was more classified than the manhattan project and they were developing an unmanned platform see one of the one of the terms and conditions of the release of francis gary powers who was shot down in the u2 over the soviet union but one of the terms and conditions in addition to 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 the uh spy swap was a cessation of all manned overflights over the soviet union and its satellite allies, the Warsaw Pact. So Lockheed, you know, w- yes, sir. We one got minute. one minute, guys. Yeah. One minute. So uh, Jim, we'll get you to wrap up. Lock- Lockheed developed the D-21 drone to fly at almost 2,400 miles an hour after being launched initially with a Blackbird, but operational with a B-52. And they had four, they had four flights over, over uh, China. But unfortunately, like Kelly Johnson said, it was his most successful failure. He had state-of-the-art airframe and 1940s electronics. I hear you there. I hear you there. All right. I want to say a big thank you to each and every one of our panel tonight for hanging on out with us and having a great UFO talk all night long. It is the month that was in the SOR roundtable, and we were real blessed to have both James Goodall and Michael Schratt, two of the best aviation historians in North America, if not the world, right now joining us from the Paranormal Chop Shop podcast. Sonny Conway always looks good in a toque, not a beanie, a toque. The fedora-wearing John Hudson from the Unbiased UFO Report, always glad to have you here. Nicole Sackage, always one of the top brains when it comes to UFOs and the news that is happening around the world. Thank you so much. And, of course, the Chad Smith, everyone. Yes, the Chad Smith. That's how we do it here on Spaced Out Radio. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, and on Twitter. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, Nicole, what do you got for us? We own the night. Absolutely. Yes, we do. Mr. Bumblefoot, take us home, will you? Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friend, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. <laughs>